There it is. Sweet. What's going on, dude? Oh, not a lot. Just enjoying my early afternoon here in sunny Portland. How are you doing? Not bad. Uh, kind of trying to adjust to being awake at this time because I work night shift. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. What do you do for work, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I work for a Rust-Oleum plant. Uh, I make paint. <laughs> oh, sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's something. We all need that. Right. Yeah. How long? Anyway, yeah. What are your hours? Uh, it's 11 to 7.30. Uh, oh. Brutal. <laughs> uh, I, I'm kind of used to it at this point. I've worked night shift jobs or I was on the railroad for a little while working like on call. Uh, so I'm used to really crazy hours. <laughs> so you actually worked on the railroad all the live long day. I did sometimes a couple <laughs> days at a time. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, I did. Uh, I preferred that schedule when I was younger. My first job ever was Taco Bell uh, when I was 16. And uh, I worked 10 to 6 a.m., 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Wow. I actually loved that schedule as a kid. But I always liked being up. I like sleeping during the day and being up at night. Yeah. You know, <laughs> person. Yeah. It's more peace, more peaceful, especially when you live in a city. I I can see that for sure. Yeah. I, uh... I don't know. It, it, it could be worse. Like, uh, I got a wife and kids that are either at work or at school while I'm asleep. And then I'm working and stuff while they're asleep. So we still get that evening in the, that same yeah. evening. A crossover. That's great. Yeah. It's the most important one. Exactly. <laughs> and you always have someone holding down the fort. Yeah. And yeah. Night shift pays more. Yeah, they tend to. That's why I worked it. I had to say it, it actually fits in pretty beautifully with my uh, uh, talking about rigs because that's I did that. I work graveyard six days a week at Taco Bell to afford my first half stack, which was uh, which was a fifty one fifty two classic, wow, uh, and an orange four twelve cabinet that I still use to this day. That's a hell I of bought that back. <laughs> What's that? That is a hell of a first stack. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to do it right. And uh, uh, before that, it was just like line six practice amps, like a Spider 2. Uh, you wouldn't believe how much vitriol shit I wrote uh, by filming myself playing riffs out of the line six Spider 2. <laughs> uh, I was kind of late late to the game with the home recording shit too um but yeah it was that and yeah it's still my main cab i have four of them now the orange cabs but the one that i bought when i was 17 uh is still my main bottom one that gets mic'd up i don't know what it is about that one but it just still sounds the fucking best i don't know if it's because that speaker's been hit with my sonic footprint enough that it kind of like you know it's like the couch with the ass groove yeah. in it you know it's, it's, i think it might yeah it's there more might be something yeah. uh then i bought a bunch of like rat gear and shit my second job was guitar center mm -hmm. and that was uh the age of the where everyone had the big spaceship rack units mm -hmm. uh, the fucking the bbe sonic maximizer <laughs> Not good. Everyone had that fucking thing. I still have it in my old rack in the garage. I uh, I kind of want to try one, and one of those old uh, I can't remember the model name, but one of the Digitech uh, rack processors, just to do like a, a devourment kind of. Yeah. Drone, you know what I mean? <laughs> Hell yeah! Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I uh, that will definitely get you there. That will definitely get you there. I think the Sonic Maximizer has some, like, studio applications. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, it became very popular to use live. And in a room, it is the thing. In a room, 
it will make it'll fool you into thinking that it makes your guitar sound better but in a venue if you get out into the crowd your guitar just sounds like nails in a chalkboard mm -hmm. like it takes all the body and the low end out of it and if you're going for like i don't know like a dime bag tone through a tube amp or something it might help you get get that extra top end bite but wasn't wasn't for me wasn't yeah. for me <laughs> yeah uh maybe i'll get like one of the pedal versions or something to try out one of these days just to see because i've never actually yeah. played one well, yeah yeah i don't even know i mean i can't explain to you the, the science that's supposed to be uh employed there i don't know what it's technically doing to your signal but um yeah it just makes it that sound like a fucking coffee can full of bees it's just like it's not not good not good do you uh do you know what uh speakers are in that favored orange cab of yours yeah v30s celestian v30s simple yeah um which is still my my favorite speaker i've played to this day um we've recorded on different shit like every vitriol recording i've done it's actually that's not true that's not true our pain will find their death ep that was tracked through my orange but the other ones for whatever reason the producer that we've gone to the engineer uh he doesn't like recording orange caps for some reason hmm. i don't know if he's just had bad experience and it's a weird personal bias but uh and even when he let me kind of shoot it out one session i think it was when we were retracking no what were we doing i think it was for the full length maybe uh i asked well can we just try like i love this cab mm -hmm. it sounded great on our ep let's give it a shot so he humored me and we tested it out but he had this marshall 1960 i don't know what some magic juju <clears throat> doesn't sound doesn't sound exactly like a marshall 1960 i've heard but you know cabs are interesting in that way they all like i have four orange ppc 412s mm -hmm. and each one of them sound fairly drastically different um it's crazy how which is really fucking frustrating it's <laughs> super frustrating because you wish you could just get a uh, you know know what something sounds like and get it yeah uh, <laughs> it's funny how that works yeah. though, for sure yeah like <laughs> uh i remember kind of doing something similar with a buddy who had uh several mesa cabs uh i think one was a roadster one was like one of the old dual rectifier cabs like with the diamond plate steel on the sides and everything oh, yeah. and i had the same speakers in my cabinet um it was an old line six cab that I took the badge off and put my own speakers in. Nice. And, uh, and they were 75s and, uh, you know, that's what he had in the dual rec cab. And it's, I mean, it sounded like two completely different rigs altogether, not even just cabs. Like it's, it's nuts. Wow. Yeah. Cabs make such a fucking difference, man. It's, and it's interesting. I mean, this is topical for anyone who's, might be watching or listening that uh is in the process of getting their own rig together like something that i see a lot especially in young professional aspiring professional or gigging metal guitar players is that they'll put all of their budget into the head and then they'll get just like a 300 hundred dollar cabinet because I, I think the logic is sound enough that you're like, yeah, well, the tone comes from the head. It's like, yeah. But you, the cab is really going to make or break it. You know, a good cab can make a underwhelming head sound good. And a bad cab can make an incredible amp sound like dog shit. Yeah. You know? So you really got to allocate your... Uh, 
your budget to prioritizing the quality of both of those things so they can speak to one another in a way that uh, makes them sound the way they're supposed to. Because, yeah. yeah, a bad cat, man, can... I had that on a European tour we did. There was just this... Uh, the booking agency, they had their own back line of cabs. Mm -hmm. And it was like these shitty fucking old Marshall cabs that I don't even remember what models they were, not a nice one. And they'd clearly just been played into the fucking ground. Uh, and uh, yeah, there was nothing you could do, man. Like I had my uh, Ingle with me and there's, there's nothing you could do. Like it's just, you do your best, but you can't you can't pull yourself out of a bad cabinet. No. <clears throat> like, uh, I don't have the recordings anymore. I wish I did, because it'd be, a, be some content. But that Line 6 cab in question, uh, like those cheap old, they were like speakers that Selection made specifically for Line 6 to sell, you know, whatever their bottom dollar Chinese-made stuff is. Probably the yeah. same thing that was in those marshals you're talking about. <laughs> Probably. Uh, Probably. And it was a literal can of bees again. A box yeah. of bees. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. It's rough. It's funny because I have a lot of uh, like sentimental love for Line 6. Like I loved, uh, like I said, I grew up playing their practice amps. Mm -hmm. Like the first high gain guitar tone I ever played truth be told first high gain guitar tone I, I ever played through was the insane mode on a spider 2 combo amp <laughs> and I'll never forget sitting there with a buddy of mine from in middle school and I start you know chugging on the fucking you know like a E power chord on my standard tune <laughs> Bronze Series Warlock with the fucking BC Rich pickups in it. And uh, I remember we just looked at each other like, whoa, this thing is fire breathing. Right. You know, it was a, a revelatory moment for me. So I still to this day joke. I'm like, if I ever get like a signature head from anyone, like, there has to be an insane mode on it. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I love the nostalgia of it because uh, my my first half stack was the Spider Three half stack. Yeah, man, I remember those well. It, it wasn't my first high gain tone, my, though. My first high gain tone was is one of those uh, cheap Fender Frontman combos. Uh, okay, I don't like, think I know that Fender Frontman. Yeah, it's like it's okay. a little solid state practice amp that came in those starter packs. Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I ran a Digitech Metal Master into the yes. <laughs> into the clean channel of that thing. Supreme. Uh, yeah, have you ever, have you ever messed with one of those? They're fun. They're they're fun. <laughs> I've ne I've never personally tweaked one. I've heard them and I've seen them all, all over the place yeah. over the years. But yeah, I've never personally. There's what I did, I did buy when it came out for whatever fucking reason, because I had already, had, I already had the 5152 and I didn't know shit about fuck at this point. Like I didn't know how pedals worked or you know, if, if you needed a distortion pedal, if you're running a high gain tube amp, like I didn't know any of this stuff. So what I did see is like, I think it was in a revolver magazine. I saw a Digitech ad for their death metal pedal. Yeah. Do you remember that? Oh Yeah rushed out to Guitar Center, bought it, returned it less than 24 hours later. <laughs> that shit sounded so fucking bad, man. <laughs> you couldn't believe how bad that pedal sounded. Uh, There's a... Especially when you can... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that uh, I was browsing Facebook Marketplace yesterday. There's a guy selling one of the old DOD death metal pedals yeah. for like... It's like over... He's selling for like over 200, I think. Oh my god! Yeah, I'm just, for like the collectability, I imagine. I what he probably thinks is collectability, anyway. Sure. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 So. Yeah. I think <laughs> I think people just try. They see something in the market is going well. 
yeah. you know, high gain distortion pedals uh, are probably more popular now than they've ever been. Yeah, I think in the history of pedal making, which is fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, especially with the whole HM2 revival thing, there's so many good options out there. And uh, yeah, I think you just have a lot of people trying to capitalize on the moment and the, you know, nostalgia running rampant, being yeah. highly coveted this day and age. So yeah. you know, you got BC, you got platinum series BC riches being sold for two thousand fucking dollars. You know, it's it's crazy time out there, man. I've said I've said a lot in the last two years where I'm like, I'm glad I got out of the game when I did. You know, like. I love guitars, man. And I, I hope there comes a day where I'm financially um, uh, where I'm financially comfortable enough to pick that hobby back up. But like to put it in perspective, I got my Warrior Pros, like my two original Warriors. When I bought those, I got the white one for 900 bucks, and I got the black one for 1100 bucks. Now you can't get them for less than three grand. Oh my god! Yeah, three grand plus. I'm just like, fuck, dude. Like my homie uh, Steven that's playing guitar, second guitar, Vitriol Live now. He's been a, I've, I've flipped him some shit for playing my guitars live, and I'm like, bro, you need to get your own guitar. <laughs> and uh, he uh, he has sick guitars, but he's like an eight string guy. Yeah, so he doesn't have. A guitar that would fit with vitriol uh and dude i have all tour this last tour we're on every fucking day reverb ebay craigslist looking at every city we were going to in craigslist i the it's just i don't know who's buying these guitars i don't know who can afford these fucking guitars man like standard u.s jackson's like five grand what happened? What the fuck happened? Like, uh, you could, when I was buying guitars, I felt like it was reasonable to find a sick, used, even like pre Fender US Jackson for 2200 Yeah. Two grand, 2500 depending on what it is. Mm -hmm. But now you can't get a basic. Uh, U.S. Select for less than like thirty five hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. It uh, <clears throat> and I I think Stephen made some uh, post a while back. It and it's the same thing I've been saying for a while. It's it's actually more affordable to do some kind of semi custom like Balaguer or go th oh, yeah. go through a smaller builder like uh, Tony from Zeno or hell honestly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is like you know, pretty top quality, but like Rob Gray, uh, oh, yeah. you know, like, which I don't want to spoil. I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, love you, Steven, but fuck you. I'm just Bill of Bean. He's getting a, he's getting a rip. He's getting a Star Destroyer. That's the guitar he ended up. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you saw on my personal Instagram, but yeah. uh, he actually came out to the Salt Lake City show and brought out two of them. And man, is uh is awesome. is Steven gonna get one of those um uh pre ordered production models that they're trying to do for later in the year or is he just doing a Yeah. Well sorta. Of. I think he's doing I think I think they're doing some sort of hybrid custom something because he's paying more for it than the production ones are going for. Cause he got a he put a Floyd on it. The production ones don't have Floyds. Um hum single instead of single hum uh different paint custom paint he's doing on it uh little stuff like that so i think rob was kind enough to be flexible with him about certain specs so long as Stephen was comfortable paying the difference yeah <clears throat> so which uh all three things I would instantly want to do with the Star Destroyer yeah. specifically. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I want one so bad. I do too, I just, but I've got one coming that I've 
got to finish paying off the other half of it. So I'm like, no, no, you can't. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, I have a problem where it's so hard for me to sell shit because I get so attached yeah. to the guitars that I have. So it's pretty gutting to get rid of any. But, uh, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about, like, man, what can I sell? What can I sell to get one of those <laughs> buns in the oven? Because it, it's great, man. Like, not only does it look great, but he really... Rob has two real strengths about him, as I mean, among many others, I'm sure. But uh, that I noticed immediately was he has a certain level of attention to detail that you'd hope you'd hope is shared by most luthiers, but in my experience, sadly, is not. Um, and he's a fucking player, and like he rips, dude. Like that dude is a ripping guitar player. Oh yeah, and. I don't know if you would be shocked, but you know maybe some people listening would be when, uh, to hear that. I would say the majority of luthiers, like more than more than fifty percent of luthiers building these guitars, are not guitar players. And that is well, that seems crazy to me. But I mean, I get it. It's like it's a craft in and of itself. So. It's hard to find the time to, I guess, develop your chops if you're spending all, all day building the guitars. But if you're able to do both, which Rob is, that gives him a certain window into the demands of high-performing uh, metal guitars yeah. that I think some other luthiers just don't really have the eyes for because they don't know what makes a guitar playable when you're playing fast. Or, uh, you know, shit like that. So it really shows in the builds and the balance. I still don't really know how we got it that way. It's such a well-balanced guitar for the shape. Oh, yeah. You know, most, most bodies like that mm -hmm. you usually have to put the pin, the strap button on the inside of the horn, like a warrior, mm -hmm. to prevent neck dive. But he got it on the back and just crazy physics huh. math science i don't <laughs> fucking know <laughs> magic uh but yeah he's he said he spent a lot of time with different templates and tweaking it because that was his his main thing his main gripe with guitars of that kind of shape was the chronic neck diving yeah uh so yeah it's and it's just a great fucking shape too it's not too derivative you know what I mean? Like, it looks yeah. like its own thing while still being classic. It doesn't seem totally alien. Like, it definitely has the Iron Bird vibe. Yeah. Kind of Xyphos meets Iron Bird meets yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah. No, yeah it's, it's definitely in the degree, but you can, t like, it's got enough little things to kind of distinguish it as his own product, for sure. Uh, Absolutely. Everything between, like, um, kind of like the edges of the horns to the headstock to you know even some of his choices as far as i don't know like as far as the specs like uh it seems pretty common just to do two humbuckers and then a floyd but he's kind of offering some different options i i'm a sucker for the hum single too oh yeah and then like some of the flashy paint jobs he's doing that haven't completely uh become the new norm trend among builders <laughs> yeah like every year there's one you know what i mean oh yeah but, oh yeah um, um yeah rob likes doing what he likes to do and i think that's such a great quality it's what attracts me so much to dylan's work too at demon s yeah i'd say rob is probably the first luthier i've personally interacted with that is is on a similar wavelength to Dylan because Dylan's just a different kind of person. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> it really it really manifests in his guitar building and his uh, how his mind works. That just makes it 
wholly its own thing. And uh, uh, Rob has a, a similar integrity to his what's idiosyncratic about what he likes and what he wants to see in a guitar. There's there's no pandering going on, you know, and that's obvious. And I love that. He's not he's not shopping to a market. He's creating his own. Well, uh, let me ask you this: uh, since you've gotten to interact and even work with a lot of the luthiers that are really popular in the extreme metal scene right now whether it's, you know, Dylan or Rob or uh, is it Preston at Roar's Guitars? Mm -hmm. um, and I know you have plenty of like custom, you know, some other custom shops, uh, yeah. which you may or may not have gotten to interact with whoever may have built those. But um, of all the, whether you're basing this off of the finished product or interactions with the builders themselves, what would you say, I'm not going to ask you to pick the best, but what would you say are some of the strengths of one compared to another? Um, like what makes each one really stand out to you individually? Well, I, I mean, it's pretty easy. It's a pretty easy question to answer for me because, um, and it might sound obvious to people is that I would say Demon S uh, has, but I mean, the thing that's, cause I, cause I work with Demon S, but, um, that happened because he was my favorite luthier. Um, so it, sorry, someone's mowing their fucking lawn. <laughs> I need to get out of here. Um, <clears throat> Uh, his work spoke to me. Um, I mean, I discovered his shit just from the website, the Demon S website. And uh, uh, I just hadn't seen anything like that before. And as a fan of guitar building and extreme metal, uh, almost equally at that point in time, um, I don't know. It's hard to describe. There's just nothing like, you know, every once in a while, you, it might be a record, might be an artist, might be whatever, but you encounter it and you're like, this person just fucking gets it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And his work has always been that. And then some like not dogging on any other builders at all. Like there's incredible builders out there, but Dylan just does it for a different reason you know, and it comes from a different place. So there's the best guitars I've played. And then about five tiers higher, there's Dylan's. And I really believe that. Yeah. I mean, I can say with total honesty that when I was get, picking up my Demon S in the UK on our uh, European tour with Nile and Hate Eternal, uh, Dylan was going to come out for the first time and bring me my guitar. And dude, I can't tell you how fucking nervous I was because I had, it built up so much in my mind as this fantastical thing. And I, I'll never forget the first, the, like three days before the day he was bringing it out, I like, as almost like a mantra, I just kept telling myself, it's just a guitar. It's just a guitar. Like it's, expect a guitar. It's going to have its, it's just a fucking guitar, man. It can only be so special. And then I got it, and it met the expectations of my wildest dreams. I mean, it. I'm so happy that I get to say, and I, this is one of the first things I told Dylan. It's like, I know a lot of people work with companies for different reasons, and you got to promote the stuff that with the companies that you're working for. And, uh, I remember playing that and just feel, this wash of relief came over me and I'm like, I'm so happy to be able to say that this is the best guitar I've ever fucking played. And I can mean it. I can look anyone dead in the fucking eye and say that, 
And I still feel that way today. And I have, you know, I have a Mike Shannon Warrior, which is probably my second favorite guitar that I own, second to Dylan's. Yeah. Uh, that the mahogany one, mm -hmm. the all natural one. Um, that's one of my all times. Um, they all have good things about it, man. I'd say uh, Preston over at Roars makes a great guitar. Um, I actually really like his. Uh, I don't know if you've ever played a Roars, but he has a custom neck profile that is like a con you familiar with a compound radius fretboard yes so instead of being a comp i mean i think it actually is a compound radius but he actually has a compound neck profile so up at the nut it's fairly meaty mm -hmm. for chords and shit like that sure and then as you go down the neck it becomes very flat and ibanez like mm-hmm and I fucking loved that. Yeah. Immediately when I pulled that thing out, I was like, uh, it does what it's supposed to do. It sounds awkward, but it feels natural. <clears throat> it's like the, the neck evolves with you depending on what you're doing, trying to do on the guitar, sure. which I really loved. Um, craftsmanship on that's beautiful. Uh, but, you know, where... I'd say the major differences is Preston is more um, kind of spec oriented. Like you get, um, there are less fully custom options, I think. But I think that reflects in the pricing as well mm. and the turnaround time. I think you get guitars faster from Preston because he's more leans a little more toward like the uh kind of kind of kiesel formula yep. which is you know we have like semi custom where it's like we have a list of options yeah and i think preston's is more robust mm -hmm. but there's still certain things he's just like nah I'm, i don't do that all right that you know we can't do that on this guitar um whereas dylan a demon s even rob I mean, Rob's doing some production stuff now, but these guys are like full-blown custom luthiers. Like, tell me what you want, I'll make you whatever the fuck you want. I'll make yeah. you whatever neck profile you want. I'll make you whatever, what the fuck ever you want. Um, so that's a different kind of personalized experience if mm -hmm. you can afford it financially and chronologically, because you're going to wait a little while. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I still kind of beat myself up a little bit for not buying Joss's uh, spot for a for yeah. the MS build. Yeah, uh, yeah, that guitar's sick too. I know. I, uh, shit, from 1349, RKO. RKO. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, ever since I saw his, I'm like, oh my god, that thing's perfect. I didn't even know I wanted yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so gnarly, man. It's so fucking gnarly. I just love everything that guy does, man. Yeah. And it's funny because he makes the sickest uh, pointy shapes, but everyone wants him to crank out those Sumerians, which is yeah. still <laughs> Dylan's favorite shape that he's done. Like, really? You mean all this crazy, right? Uh, innovative shit, and your favorite guitar is your Super Strat? I mean, I'm a little biased because I'm not a Super Strat guy, as everybody fucking knows it's not that i hate them yeah. i'm just like you know why would i want to play a round boy when i can <laughs> play guitars that you can kill dragons with and shit you know when when, I'm I, much had, rather do that. when I had dylan on here we nerded out for like a good 15 20 minutes about how perfect the rg is <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean and i can totally respect that from playability standpoint. Dylan standpoint of playability yeah. uh just the kind of the nerdy physics of Lou 3 it's a great guitar i think it's de the rg is definitely i mean to this day my favorite guitar to play well, <laughs> i know it's tough. Yeah, I don't want to put words in my mouth um 
one of my favorite guitars to play. I would say top three. I'll, I'll play it safe. Okay. Top three favorite guitars to play is my first nice guitar I ever bought, which was an RG2. I'll just show you, actually. Let me show you. Let's see here. Let's see, there's nothing incriminating in here. <laughs> This is my. This is where I write shit. Nice. Do all my acoustic ballads. Oh, this is actually. I kind of like. This was my first first kind of nice guitar. This NJ Sunburst Warlock that doesn't have pickups right now. Nice. I don't think I've ever seen that one. Oh, dude, it's so good, and it's still so good. I really want to get this guy all suited back up because it has a great top on it it feels great it's mahogany this is when they were used still <laughs> using actual mahogany yeah got the cloud inlays the fucking rosewood widow headstock thing's fucking mean man damn yeah i love this thing i played the shit out of this thing I'll never forget. This is I went and auditioned for my first band, like real band, when I was seventeen, and I showed up with this. Hmm. And I remember I basically was literally laughed out of the audition because it was like some band that was like, uh, you know, they were really into shit like Dillinger and Between the Buried and Me and stuff like that. Uh, so they, they were all doing the, uh, you know like ESP horizons yeah, strapped up to their chest and stuff like that, which is cool. But, uh, uh, yeah, it was very not in vogue to be, uh, playing a warlock at that time. But this is my, I fucking love this guitar, man. That's my RGT prestige. Oh, I I remember wanting one so bad for so long. <laughs> like, I have a buddy that has the exact same one. But oh yeah, yeah. Good luck finding those two. <laughs> and they really hold their value, man. Like, to get one of these used is the same amount it was to buy new. And this, these were made, partly why these are so nice, mm -hmm. is that these were made in the uh, J, J Craft J Custom Factory. Oh, okay. So it was the, the only production guitar they had at the time that was made by the, the Japanese custom shop. Wow. And they were fucking $2,000. Brand new. Two grand. Oh, better times, man. Better times. I don't know why I thought they were made yeah. at the Fuji factory for some reason, but that's awesome to know. Yeah. Uh, they did a uh, NAM did a, uh, they did a custom one limited run in a, Oh God, what was it? It was like a baked, like a barbecued ash. Hmm. That was so cool. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, I love Ibanez, man. I, I really wish they would have uh, made a prestige Zyphos. Yeah, with them, with them kind of bringing it back with the Iron Label series, I don't know, maybe there's hope one day? Who knows? It seems like, yeah. it seems like the pointy stuff is, like we were talking about the death metal distortion revival and all that, pointy yeah. guitars coming back. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, with a vengeance, with a vengeance. And that has good, good, good uh, reverberating effects and not so good ones, which are yeah. like, like we illustrated earlier, like platinum fucking class act, class act fucking BC Rich is selling for like two grand and shit. You know, it's like, dude, because this is how it cycles, right? This is the cycling psychology of trends. It starts with good intention people rediscover what something has to offer they fall in love with it uh and it's genuine for a while 
And then you get the sharks and the fucking resell predators yeah. that inflate <laughs> the value of these things beyond the point of what's reasonable. And then the downfall starts happening because what it's doing is creating the psychology and the consumer base, this kind of pre prejudicial psychology of like, these guitars aren't worth that much and they're fucking right. Right. So it's like, and then people get all, Oh, fucking these trendy pointy guitars or whatever, which is funny to say now, because not that long ago they weren't at all. Right. Uh, and, uh, Oh, you know, they're not they're It's all, it's all, form and no function it's all for looks and i'm not paying two extra thousand dollars for a guitar that just has extra points on it that i can chip up and then the downfall starts happening and then you have people being like fuck it i'm just gonna play an rg because i can get one for half the cost that is arguably better quality than some of these guitars my whole argument is you can have your cake and eat it too that's what I never understood. Like when I was coming up, I already mentioned I kind of got some not so great peer influence about my warlock when I was a kid. And I remember, like, I drank the Kool Aid for a minute. And that's a big reason why I got my Ibanez, you know, when I was younger. It's like, okay, if I want to be a serious guitar player, I can't be playing around with these, like, new metal like mall metal guitars or whatever which at the time they were perceived as you know and uh i didn't think so of course but you know we were young and don't get it uh played that and i just couldn't put down the frustration of, like why do you have to choose yeah like why can't they make a serious player's guitar that looks fucking cool right. and feels empowering to play, you know? And uh, so that's when the, my journey started, you know, I was like, I really want both. And then my guitar after my Ibanez RGT was uh, an ESP in V. The, mm. yeah. I had a Kaler and the Iron Cross inlay is like John Gallagher from Feet has played one for a long time. Yeah. I had that thing and I, that, that started my love affair with V's. Um, and that was it. I, I didn't buy another round guitar after that. Uh, I bother, yeah. you know? Yeah, exactly. And now, uh, <laughs> now that I have a demon S and all that shit, it's like, you know, I'm not a, yeah, we're up. <laughs> exactly. I saw that always pointy, always neon. <laughs> yeah. I used to be on a rip shirt. Uh, there you go, Rob. Yeah, I uh, I can sympathize because I've talked about it on here before. Uh, there's not a lot of like uh, much of a metal scene where I'm at. Kind of, but not really. It's much more of, or at least it was for me coming up, a hardcore and punk scene. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, if you showed up with a BC Ridge or one of the pointier Jacksons, you know, they just laughed at you. Uh, everything was like some sort of Gibson or, you know, a Gibson-esque LTD if you didn't have money. Oh, yeah. The um, Eclipse. Yeah. 1000 series. I mean, how many see-through red, trans-red quilted Eclipses with the abalone binding did you fucking see on stage growing up? Which, which I do have. I do have an eclipse. It's the satin black with the gold and. Oh, yeah. that's the best one. Wait, I got that one, and I was like, "It's like, well, it's like this is sort of the compromise because I'm seeing guys like, like Demu and Red Cord and and you know yeah. bands I like that are playing these. So yeah. this is a good halfway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I came out with the Floyded ones, which is fucking cool. Which, after they did, I'm like, damn it, if I just held out a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> and they had, uh, I think, I don't I don't know if they were the first, but they, uh, that was one of the first single cuts I'd seen that had 24 frets. Other than, like, some random, 
crazy expensive Les Pauls, like the Alex Lifeson ones. I hadn't, yeah. I hadn't seen one prior. I thought that was great. You know which one? So, I think the Jackson Monarch. I, I feel like they should put one out with the Floyd if they haven't already. Like, I think that'd be kill. Who's that? Sorry, say again. Uh, Jackson, the Monarch, their single cut. Oh, yeah. Yes. Like, uh, I, I, I'm surprised we don't see more of those. I think those look wicked for a single cut with, like, the uh, three-on-three soloist headstock. Yeah, it looks good. Um, I think... I think it's uh it's interesting if I had to guess if if I had to wager I'd say that it it, it departs too much from what people like about single cut style Les Paul style guitars which is you get a Les Paul because it's a big fucking chunk of guitar right yeah. it's a big you know sad neck big old fucking heavy body right sustain the whole thing and the monarch is like if you played one they're quite thin like the it, it feels like a shredder guitar mm -hmm. but it just has the single cut look and i think the intersection between people who want the feel of a shredder contemporary metal guitar mm -hmm. but the look of a single cut is probably narrow enough that it just didn't really pop off that's just my guess because yeah. that was my thing it's like usually if you're going to get a single cut you get it for a reason sure you know uh, well that, and i think that that's what kind of confuses me because i feel like the eclipse kind of fits in that same description almost like they're not crazy they got the the version that is like the full thickness like the traditional cut or whatever now yeah, but the majority of them are you know thinner bodies and like my RG weighs more than my Eclipse does. You know, it's weird. Yeah, uh, people yeah, are. It is interesting. <laughs> it, it might just it might just be like a brand identity thing. Whereas, you know, Jackson, I think ESP is has a more well rounded demographic. Like it's not just like innovative forward thinking like metalheads mm -hmm. you know uh, so i think they have their foot in the kind of classic guitar market in a way that jackson doesn't i don't know right. i'm just speculating but yeah it is interesting yeah i totally get that <clears throat> um real quick because i've forgotten mm -hmm. several times already <laughs> there were a couple questions uh oh, yeah somebody asked earlier if we have thoughts on warehouse audio speakers i'm not familiar myself i am not warehouse audio no i've never heard of that i wish i could uh it's not that's not wgs is it like warehouse guitar speakers oh, I, don't know. Uh, I don't know yeah I don't know what else here. it's like uh if you if whoever submitted that if you're still on here uh clarify please uh, yeah. uh then somebody else let me see Hey, reveal the secret. When will the vitriol tab book be released? Uh, good question. <laughs> um, it's actually my top priority coming home from tour, which I am now. Uh, we've been back since Monday, so I think we're all still like, I, I got off the tour real sick, but it, long story short, it's the first thing I'm working on when I get back, it's right now, the tab books are like 50% done. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm like reading these and be good being distracted. Uh, I get it. <laughs> the, tab book is, the tab book is close. Um, I've just been so between like training a new guitar player um, after Mike left, uh, also, I could bore you, but steel weather, all that. Unfortunately, it didn't get out as quickly as I would have liked, but um, it will be completed, the work at least. I don't know when it's going to come out because that's kind of up to the company that puts it out, but um, it will be done in the next couple months. That is my 
promise to myself. Gotcha. Chris, I am n no. I was very fortunate to wear a gentleman who plays some crazy Berkeley guitar player that played an atheist when we toured with atheist. He um, really liked the band, really liked Vitriol, and at the end of the tour, he approached me and was like, hey, man, I'd, I'd really love to tab out your album um, if you need to. And I jumped at the opportunity. He was actually the same guy that did all the revocation tab books and stuff. Oh, wow. He did, he did the tabbing for Dave Davidson because um, he's just kind of, you know, like I could fumble through it, but I'm not literate enough with the software to where I'd feel like, you know, people could put out books and be like, this is 99% accurate. It's like, it might be like 53%. <laughs> it's best I can guarantee you. Uh, but yeah, with this, uh, he's uh, been very generous with his time and skills. and So basically the process is, I record myself playing the riffs like at 60% and then at full speed and I send them to him and he tabs it out and sends it back to me and da 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 da. Which, uh, yes, Reese, he did. <laughs> Very cool. That was actually um, the tour that uh, me and my wife got to come see you all play was the one with Atheist and Cattle Decap. Oh, really? Awesome. Author and Punisher. Yeah. Yeah, which that was a great tour. Oh my god, <laughs> the whole the whole time uh, Author and Punisher was playing, I I couldn't help but just smile. You know what I mean? Like it's just yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that that guy is such a joy to watch. You know, and what I didn't realize until I did the tour with him is that he's an engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, so it made it made his whole. Uh, gear setup mm -hmm. added a whole nother layer of appreciation to it absolutely because he actually built all that shit and designed all that shit himself yeah just nuts man so oh. cool it's like apex Twitter. it's music performance art it's like all it's doing everything uh apex twin did the same thing he built all his own uh oh. synthesizers and instruments and stuff like that Oh, it's crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah. The, those guys, wow. that's, that, like you said, it's like a whole other level with guys like that. Yeah. Um, somebody did, uh, that guy did clarify WGS speakers, by the way, which I've, I've heard of and I follow their page. I've never tried one. Are they speakers like, like that you load into cabinets or speakers yeah. like monitors? Okay. Yeah. They're guitar, uh, they're, you know, cab speakers. Um, yeah okay cool um i'm trying to think i want to say maybe the guys from uh bt bam or somebody uses like their veteran okay. 30 i know that like it's like their take on the b30 with okay. maybe a little bit more chill upper mid-range spike than the than the typical v30 yeah i like the typical v30 more than i think <laughs> that's what i really like about it is that uh I love, as much as I love modern sounds, there's something about that just pissed mid-range grind, like upper mid-range grind, that you get from kind of the classic British gear. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I like Marshalls. Uh, like my modern Marshall is the end-all, be-all amp for me. Because uh, with Fortin, with Mike Fortin modding it, it's really, you get to have your cake and eat it too. You get the really contemporary, high gain, highly saturated, thick, pronounced, defined, but with all of that just rough and rowdy, like donkey kick to the fucking chest, like mid range push that classic marshals give you. And then you run that through an orange cab with no casters. And that plays a big sonic role in it because it's deeply inconvenient, but there's a reason they don't have fucking casters. There's those big wooden slats yeah. that sit on the ground. 
and the resonance, the transference between the stage and the cab, you just get this tight low end. And once you put it on casters, it just disappears. Um, the combination between the V30s, the orange cab, and the high game Marshall head is mid range bliss. I love it. Is uh, is that going to be? That's it makes for a nice little segue. Is that going to be your uh, live setup for coming uh, vitriol shows? The Fort and Modern Marshall or the Ingle or what are you looking at? Yeah, it would definitely be the Marshalls. I'm not going to go back to the, I love the Ingle. And I will say, uh, I'm not just trying to be overly diplomatic here. I think they're apples and oranges. It's, I can't say that the Marshalls are better. Um, uh, I just saw a neural DSP archetype plug in. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't uh say no it's just tough because the fortin plugins have treated me so well um but that would be sick and i'm actually which will uh, uh maybe be controversial news to some people because i know how tribalistic we all like to be when it comes to our amp types but i am actually investing in a modeler for our european tour because I can't bring my head over. Right. And the last time I went to Europe, um, I just had some generic Marshall that I, don't, I think it was a 900, and it just wasn't good. It was, you know, not modded, nothing like that. And so I am going to get one of those uh, Line 6 HX stomps uh, and make it kind of like a fly rig. And that'll be. A good excuse to get my toes wet yeah. into the the modeling thing. I don't think Steven, the other guitar player in Vitriol, just got an FM3, the fractal floor unit. Mm -hmm. and it sounds it sounds really good. Um, it doesn't sound at its best. I think it sounds maybe eighty five percent as good as a, as a as the best tube head I could ask for. And that 15% isn't negligible to the point that until modeling gets that much further, I'll still be a tube amp guy uh, over here in the States. But for traveling, it's the lesser of the evils, I think, because uh, you, you never know what heads you're going to get when you're traveling internationally. So I'd rather have rather have the line six and then i can use that as a multi-effects processor on my board here in the states and replace like my standalone delay and reverb and shit so uh so i <clears throat> i ran through several different of the helix family products and i ultimately landed on the hx stomp there for a while as well oh um, nice uh you know did some writing with it and you know we ran it through like one of those old uh, uh, what is it? <laughs> tube works, most valve power amps. If you remember those, like, okay. Yeah. And uh, also through the dual rectifier that I had at the time. And yeah. eventually I was kind of so won over with it. Um, ended up selling a bunch of stuff and now I have a Kemper and now half my audience like secretly hates me, I think. <laughs> but, yeah, that's but, funny. yeah, no, that's good. Be on, be on the right side of history. I mean, I don't, like I love tube amps. I get it. Like I get, I get the impulse to be a purist about it. Hundred percent, you know. Um, but it's, I don't know. I maybe I'm trying to look for a more complicated way to say, just like. Uh, I think part of the problem is people have a hard time approaching something for what it is on its own and not being totally sidelined by this comparison, yeah. right? It's kind of like fake meat and real meat or something like that. Yeah. Where it's like, if you're so focused on the fake meat, tasting like what it's supposed to taste like and you're not focused on like is it just good yeah is it possible it's just good on its own 
I mean, certainly not always, but you know, if I think the, the better you are about the more you're able to meet something where it is, the better chances you'll have of unearthing what is good about it. And I think the modeling thing is that, you know, people will throw on a preset that's supposed to be like Friedman BE 100. This doesn't sound like Friedman. Well, of course, fucking not. It's not a fucking Friedman. Yeah. Does it sound good? Like, I don't, I think most people don't even get to that question. Yeah, because they're so frustrated that oh, this is not the real thing. No, it's not the real thing. But does it have a? Does it serve its purpose? Was it? Say, knowing that you're a fan of the Madman, J.R. Hayes, what's your favorite Big Destroy album lyric? Ooh. Favorite Big Destroyer album or lyric? Prowler in the Yard is my favorite album. Kind of um, has to be. It's like, it's so fucking, I mean, you know, I, I'm, was never much of like a grind core guy, mm -hmm. uh, and probably in the yard, it's definitely, mm, I think that's fair to say, uh, maybe their darkest, yeah. I mean, they're all dark, right? But there was something really like sinister about that album that really drew me in but my favorite lyric uh is the girl in the slayer jacket um that is like one of my favorite pieces of poetry yeah uh, i think that's such a he's he's insane he's just such an incredible writer and uh it's so such a gift that the genre gets uh gets guys like that popping in and contributing. It really elevates the whole thing. So I'm, I'm thanks to Tyler just because it's like, that's my, my wife's favorite song from them. And that's like her favorite band. And really? that was even oh, that's awesome. her IG handle for the longest time. Really? <laughs> yeah. <That's awesome. laughs> so yeah, that song fucked me up, man. Like that shit was so good. Uh, speaking of people that, you encounter and you're like, they just get it, you know? Yeah. I'll read that first page. What early, I'm not sure if you watched this video on YouTube, really early pig destroyer show. I don't know what happened, but about halfway through, if you need any evidence for this guy's sincerity and outrage, halfway through their set, his mic literally falls apart. I don't know what happened, but like the ball fell, it just dismantles and like fucking disintegrates in his hand. And he finishes the song with no mic, just screaming. And it's almost like the volume didn't even drop. Like this is dude over drums, over amplified guitars. This dude is, sounds like he's being burned alive, man. Like there's just a, a conviction to his performances that are further legitimized by the commitment to his lyrical content that he's, he's one of the real ones, you know, like it's, he's such an inspiring musician, regardless of genres, whatever, like he's a, uh, Put on my pretentious hat. He's a, <laughs> he's a true artist. He's a true artist in that way. And I, I really appreciate that. Uh, he alone did a lot to cement my commitment to an uncompromising approach to the lyrics and, and uh, well, really everything the band does. Um, no, I, I see where you're coming from for sure. Because, um, I always kind of make a parallel between horror movies and death metal as most people probably would. But, uh, what I mean in, in that is, 
So like with horror movies, you'll have, you know, your a typical 80 slashers, like your Friday the 13th or the Prowler or whatever. And it's just kind of schlocky, kind of trashy fun. Yeah. You no, know, it's very surface value. There's not a whole lot of depth going on there, but you don't need it to be. Yeah. It's fun. Exactly. Um, and then that you get it. Slam. Huh? Like porno slam. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you get into the stuff that's a little bit more high art. It's very thought provoking. Um, yeah. I, 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 you could maybe throw Hellraiser in there or like uh, some of the yeah. or like A24 kind of movies, yeah. you know, stuff uh -huh. like that. And uh, Lars von Trier is one of my favorites. God. Uh, Andy Christ. Totally. Fucking sperm swamp, baby. You know it. <laughs> <laughs> what a oh, great dude. interjection. <laughs> Love sperm swamp, dude. Torso fuck. Erotic diarrhea fantasy. I had that <laughs> CD. I had the jewel case of that CD on my car for years. It ruined a date or two for me. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great by elegance, man. Great by fucking elephants. One of the greatest songs ever written. I will never go back to Africa again. Christ. Uh, and they huffed and they puffed and they shit all over me. That's Poetry. <laughs> Cock and ball torture. Some taper tits. Some koala cunt. When, yeah, man. When you mentioned that ruined a date for you, I got a flash of that really shitty, uh, like comedy. It was like this uh, romantic comedy. Um, what the fuck is it called? Best Friends Girl or something? or so, I don't know. It was a Dane Cook. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a part where like, he would try to purposely sabotage dates. The girls ran back to their ex. Well, one of his uh, gags that he would pull is he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, you know, uh, I've got a two live crew. He had like a two live crew di uh, tape that was stuck. In his uh, in his you know player, and it was it could only play full volume. And you couldn't turn it off. So as soon as they would start the car, pop that pussy would come on blaring yeah. full volume. Oh my god, <laughs> that's hilarious! It was that that's a good filter, huh? It's a good filter for people you know you you want to spend time with. For the record, that movie, other than that joke and the cheese's crust pizza place. Those are the only two funny jokes in that in that movie. What movie is it? You said? I think it's called My Best Friend's Girl. It's Dane Cook okay. and, the, and the Pie Dude. Oh God, uh, Dane Cook movie. Holy shit! Yeah, I haven't been back in a long time. Uh, the pizza place is pretty hilarious. They go to this uh, religious themed pizza place called Jesus Crust, <laughs> and. Uh, he even has a flavor savior discount card, and it's like hands, and they hole punch the hands. No, oh my god! <laughs> and he like he takes this super religious chick there to sabotage the day. And it's it's pretty good. That's fucking funny. That's cheap. <laughs> I might have to watch this. I would just YouTube those two parts. Honestly, everything else is pretty shit. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, enough rom coms, but uh, yeah, <laughs> no, they're absolutely the uh, same thing with um, the talk about having a player's guitar that can be extreme and pointy. It's the same thing, like, there's room for high art or something that's thought provoking in extreme music, whether it's lyrics or you know, musicality or even the instruments and build quality. It's all kind yeah, it's of the same wavelength. Yeah, the culture, though, what's interesting about death metal is uh, very unlike black metal. Um, another line of division between two communities, fans of extreme music. In death metal, there's something very anti-pretentious in the culture of death metal. It's because it's such a working man's music. And I love that about it. Mm -hmm. But there is this, like, if you talk about art and death metal in the same sentence, you, you're you going to have a hard time with most people, uh, fans. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's 
I, on one hand, I get it. On the other hand, I think it's really stifling um, to the genre because there's so much. There's something about the human experience that death metal is able to speak to and for that no other genre can do. Um, and I think almost this kind of like, a, it's almost like reverse elitism almost about like, if you take your shit too seriously, mm -hmm. like at the end of the day, it's just like riffs and blast beats, dude, chill out. And it's like, well, some bands, and I love some of those bands, sure. but um, I, it's, <laughs> I, would, I would love to see more musicians, uh, <clears throat> creators of extreme music feel more emboldened and um, free to pursue the heights of self-expression and truth-telling through the medium. Um, and you see, you see that in horror films, you know, you see people taking these different approaches, like you said, I mean, I think Hereditary is a really good example mm -hmm. of a movie that had its cake and ate it as well. You know, it was about as artistically devoted as a horror movie can be, mm -hmm. but it also didn't shy away from gore, from yeah. violence, from overt brutality, because it understood that there's a language there mm -hmm. that is valuable. It's not just cheap thrills, but I think people find themselves too strongly on one side of or the other, where it's like, oh, I don't, I don't want to show any gratuitous violence because, well, I'm trying to make a, a thought piece. Right. And it's like, well, like, well, you know, you're kind of, and this is why I like Lars von Trier so much too. I mean, Annie Christ was a big movie for me. Uh, it's actually what our, the song and EP title was inspired okay. by. Um, I really was really moved by the depiction of the the devil's church effectively being in the tranquility of this wild you know and i thought that was really beautiful and novel in a film uh to depict the absence of god as kind of like a silent moment but still very harrowing uh i was just so impacted by that movie so i spent a lot of time kind of um chewing on that concept uh so the lyrics to antichrist are really they're not about the movie but they're definitely inspired by sure. how he framed almost hell on earth Right, because when they go out in the wild, you know, when they go back to the cabin where she was a, to face her fear, like this is clearly um, beyond the the bounds of uh, God's dominion in some way. And uh, yeah, I thought that was so fucking cool. Anyway, not to go too far. Oh no, no, it. <clears throat> um, we were well. I will say we're big fans of Lars von Trier, but really we've only seen the two, and Melancholia is still on my watch list. Uh, we've really only watched Antichrist and uh, House of Jack Built. Um, that was a, I know that wasn't a hit or miss for people, but I loved it. Dude, have, the House of Jack Built is... It can be so fucking hilarious in the most brutal, dark... What, what, American Psycho is one of my all-time favorites. Like, we have... Oh. Yeah, we have a oh. giant framed picture of Patrick Bateman in our living room, that's like the size of both of our wedding photos combined. That's awesome. <laughs> Unbelievable <laughs> movie, man! It's oh, yeah. definitely in my top five of all time. Yeah, but uh, I, I I liked I tended to favor House of Jack build for face value, I guess. Enjoy like just watching enjoyment. 
like at, just at first glance without picking it apart, I kind of enjoyed it more. And then as I dug into it, I kind of liked how it's sort of the the overlaying like back and forth between him and Virgil is supposed to be kind of meta for like critique and reviews from other people. Mm. You know what I mean? Like uh, the whole, uh, the whole idea of critics versus the artist is, is okay. It's kind of like, that. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. I didn't even think about that. Message. It's kind of weave throughout the whole movie. Um, and it's sort of like the moment you start talking about it, you kind of prove the point, you know? Yeah. Um, there's a real, there's, really interesting. there is a really cool, uh, oh my God, I can't remember the YouTuber, but he did a really, really cool uh, video kind of picking that idea apart. Um, mm. Antichrist, I need to revisit. I watched it one time and I remember <laughs> when I got done watching it, I just didn't know how I felt about anything. <laughs> <laughs> not the movie but anything yeah <laughs> like, yeah yeah it's like yeah am i happy am i sad yeah. where am i but that's you know that's some of my favorite movies that and then just right art in general sorry what was that somebody in the comments uh chimed in ryan hollinger that is the youtuber oh okay cool he does these really really sick they're not just reviews. Like he actually tries to really deep dive on hidden meanings in movies and things like that. Uh, an all, all horror, typic, you know. But really, and, oh, I got to watch this guy. And he really, uh, he really deep dive on uh, Lars von Trier. Um, and you know, some people will kind of say Lars is maybe a little bit pretentious, but. Uh, it, it, well, it's kind of like what we were talking about. Like, it's just riffs and blast beats, dude. You know? Yeah. It's, yeah. I'm glad you can't complain for all of it. Yeah, you can't uh, save people from having that attitude. Some people just don't want. Um, I don't know. I have dear friends that um, just don't like thinking too hard about much. And I think there's a kind of a wisdom of living that way. And I think whenever you try to, whenever you try to impose upon someone with a uh, an invitation to look at things that they don't want to look at, it's easier to just call call pretentious and uh, dismiss it and move on. Yeah. And that's okay, man. That's, that's just something you have to lean into. Like if you, if you're trying to like say some shit, uh, or really trying to sell an experience with whatever art you're making, um, you're going to have people lob that criticism at you, you know? You just kind of have to, like for a long time, I mean, I'm such a product of my environment that growing up listening to this music, like I refused to call it art or to even refer to myself as an artist. Right. Because it just sounds like such a cunty thing to say, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, that's just, that's what I was programmed to think. And it took a lot of, for my own sake to preserve the in my own world, right. In my own perspective on life, I had to strong arm my way out of that emotional programmed, emotional response to that. And be like, you know, it's not a bad fucking word. Like there are plenty of people that use that word it's a loaded word or there's plenty of people trying to make something out of something that isn't. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know what you're doing, you know what your approach is. And if that's what it is, there's value in referring to it as that. If, if not to other people, to your fucking self, cause it's a good way of reminding yourself what you're up to. Yeah. You know, if you try to kind of gaslight yourself and be like, Oh, I just make riffs and stuff. It's like, well, what are you going to do then? You're just going to make riffs. 
if that's what you want to do, great. All the power to you. I love bands, a lot of bands that just set out to do that. But, you know, it's... Uh, if you can make it past the shore there, I think there are a lot of... There's a lot of fruit. And especially if you, you try to remain humble and down to earth. Um, and you also don't vilify music that isn't made with such a robust intentionality, you know? So. Well, um, kind of on that, on that same note then, which viewers, I, I promise we'll swing this back around to gear here in a minute. It's probably torture for those that don't know what we're talking about. But um, <clears throat> some, I, some I had in mind that I wanted to ask you going into this was, uh, you know, we're, We've stated several times we're absolutely in a death death metal revival right now over the last few years. Um, majority of bands are kind of taking a lot of the traditions and tropes of the genre and and putting you know their own signature kind of stamp on it and then running with some, you know the foundation that some other people have already built up. Uh, it seems like vitriol are one of the few that obviously you guys I'm sure have your influences and you can, you can kind of maybe pick out some here and there, but for the most part, you guys just said, nah, we're just going to start a whole different thing. Um, something very fresh and trying to do something new, not just a revival kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What do you think has been sort of your best tools in shaping what vitriol has turned out to be? Like, uh, would you say it'd be like deep diving into theory books or simply hodgepodging ideas inspired by your favorite bands or something deeper? Um, I'd say the group what I attribute to that result of our sound is really loving this music. That's my strongest gift, you know, like it's not, and this isn't me being falsely humble. Like I really believe like I'll look at anyone and say like, I'm not the cleanest guitar player in the world. I'm not the most learned, you know, I don't know shit about fuck when it comes to theory or I don't know a scale. I think I remember a scale uh, from like jazz class in middle school. But uh, uh, I didn't realize, I kind of took it for granted because I'm, uh, I'm an emotional dude. And while that had... Uh, not the most positive consequences interpersonally growing up with uh, rough men and boys. Uh, it granted me the gift to fall in love with things at a depth of devotion that other people seem to have a hard time accessing. I fell in love with this music. I... There's nothing in the fucking world. See, I'm getting emotional now just talking about it. <laughs> There's nothing in the world that is more important to me than extreme metal music. Um, for a lot of reasons. I found it when I was 13. It's when I found death metal. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget it. I'll never fucking forget what it looked like in my room, where I was pacing in my bedroom. I heard Chris Barnes's vocals. Those are the first death metal vocals I ever heard, which is funny to think about now. But, uh, <laughs> he, you know, he had his time and he fucking, man. So hmm. I heard that shit and I just remember all I could think was like, this is what I'm doing now. Like, this is what I want to do with my time here. Like, I want to be about whatever this guy's about. I'm about that, you know? And uh, 
I just had a started going to shows. It was my whole fucking life, man. And what I didn't know, and this is why I tell people that ask me about what do I recommend for developing their own sound or style. I'm like, fall in love with music, man. Like music is a conversation. You know, people talk about originality. Uh, that's a difficult subjective word. Cause it's like, everything is a reference to something, you know, and it's how honestly you're willing to translate what you love about the music that makes it unique. Kind of like, I think if you're going to be a connoisseur with anything, like let's say like a foodie, right? Like you're a food guy. The farther down that rabbit hole you go, and if you have a discerning taste, well, your taste is going to become more and more discerning over time. You're going to start picking out what you like, what you don't like, what really gets you going, what not so much, and you follow that journey far enough and you will arrive at what looks like to be almost a wholly personal idiosyncratic taste in what you like, right? Now you're eating weird fucking shit. And I think loving anything has that effect. And I fell in love with extreme aggressive music. I've been listening to it almost every day for over half my life. And, uh, what I did is through a long career of loving this music, I found out what I liked. I found out what I didn't like. Uh, waxing philosophical about extreme metal genres, figuring out what their role was in the, in the voice of that human experience, of adversity, of overcoming, misery, suffering, uh, I wanted to take all the elements that worked for me through this journey of really honing in on what I loved about it. And then I just took all my favorite parts and I was like, I just kind of had like a fantasy football kind of mentality about it. I'm like, yeah. what if all my favorite players were on the same team? Yeah. Um, that's what I did with the music. I was like, one of all my favorite aspects, what I love about the black metal that I love, what I love about the death metal that I love, what I love about thrash that I love, what I love about some hardcore, like classic hardcore that I love, right? And, and using the tools that those genres provided to speak the message I was trying to speak with Vitro, which at least with that first record was unbridled wrath and aggression, you know. Um, and I didn't, I can tell you this right now, I did not go out of my way to make something unique. I went out of my way, like if, well, I don't mean to go too long on this, but I think going back to the connoisseur example, if you follow that rabbit hole down, 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 down far enough, you'll probably get to a point where your what is available to you stops and your imagination starts to take over, right? You've dug the well as deep as you can and uh, at some point you'd be like, man, wouldn't it be cool if, right? And then your own personal tastes will inform if, you're, if your imagination provides what you'd really love to hear in that next deep dive. So for me, vitriol has always been my fantasy as a fan of extreme metal. Like I didn't want, I was like, man, I'm so sick of these pissed albums, like pulling punches or having one song that like, I just want to fucking just, I want someone to fucking kill me. <laughs> I want someone to fucking hate me with music for 40 fucking minutes. And so I made it because that's what I wanted, right? I, I wanted that as a listener. And I trust enough in the universal experience of what it is to be human that if you really want something, I can promise you 
that there are other people that really want that too. You know, I can't tell you how many, but if it's a deeply held belief and desire and you do everything you can to bring that to fruition with as much integrity and devotion as you can, cool shit fucking happens. Cool shit happened for me. And uh, I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful. And I feel a lot less alone. And that's the beautiful thing about trying hard at things <laughs> every <laughs> once in a while. And I know that that's, uh, you know, uh, for some reason, this day and age, people don't like trying hard at things. But not everyone. But, you know, there's kind of a derogatory connotation to being a try hard. But, like, that's a, that's a, that's a brand I'll wear proudly. I don't give a fuck. You know, like, I try fucking hard. You're damn right I try fucking hard. You know, and uh, this music has just given me so much. It's given me so much. It's seen me. It's given me so much strength. It's given me purpose. It's given me a healthy outlet for my most negative emotions, of which I have plenty. And, uh, you know, people always say, like, man, you're such a nice guy. It's so funny to see you on stage. It's like, well, it's because I get on stage, man. <laughs> if I didn't have that stage to climb on, I wouldn't be able to partition these worlds off. But, you know, it's easier for me to... That's why if I go too long without a show, it gets pretty dicey in my head, you know? Because it's the one place where you can just be a fucking animal. Yeah. You know? And, man, it's so cathartic. I feel, you know, there are people that watch Vitriol Live or even me just play, and you're always going to have this polarizing response other people are going to see what's going on relate to it and be like man that's that's cool that's catharsis that's that's love right uh or people would be like oh like what are these you know guys trying to fucking like just chill out dude to just play the riffs and it's like i really am not saying this to for effect but like i really genuinely feel bad for those people because uh, you're not giving yourself permission to one of the most beautiful things about this kind of music, and that's to worship and exalt the fucking animal, you know, and to exercise the animal. And we all have outlets for that. Some people have sports, right? Some people fuck a lot, whatever. You know what I mean? We all have a way to exercise the beast. Yeah. And death metal and extreme metal in general is the apex. I mean, this is why, in my opinion, why Satanism is so entangled within the, the, the philosophy of metal. Because through the Christian lens, well, what does Satan really represent? The beast, right? He's the animal. He's everything carnal. He's everything earthly. He's the sweat and the blood and the piss and the vinegar and the cum and the all that shit, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, that is regardless of you look you look beyond a religious or spiritual lens. That's what metal is about. Metal is about that. knowing your animal mm -hmm. and fuck if you don't know your animal it's going to govern you it's going to pull your strings and you won't even know it you know i think it's a such an important epistemological tool to have extreme metal to know this part of your soul that is there is Incre diminishing safe spaces to 
experience that animal, mm -hmm. you know, um, in terms of what's socially permissible. Um, you know, you, and God damn, am I so grateful for this music? Um, not just for myself, but for society at large, that it's one of these mirrors where you can go in and just see the beast and man and all of its glory. And it's glorious. It is glorious. And if unchecked or whatever, just like anything, any, any, uh, good to see you, York. Um, like any issue of balance, you know, there's some responsibility there. Uh, but yeah, I could, I could wax on forever, but I like, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> this is why I can, I, I love this music for many reasons beyond the sonic elements. Um, but it's just why I get kind of, I don't want to say frustrated because I understand, but whenever I have to have, um, whenever I have conversations about like art in metal, I'm like, man, it's just so obvious. If you look at it, if you're willing to look at it through that lens, it's so obvious. Like, why do these instruments do what they do? Why, why are the drums going? Why, why did the genre like that? Yeah. What does it speak to? <clears throat> Why are the vocals trying to sound as bestial as possible? You know, like everything metal does is to get you closer to your animal. Uh, and I think it's such a worthwhile pursuit. Uh, if for no other reason than to be able to control it, you know. Wow. Um. Anyway, thank, thank you. We should probably talk about rigs. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for the uh, expectedly profound answer. Uh, thank you. It was, yeah. it was definitely something I've been wanting to pick your brain about and, and, and hear your response for quite a while. And it, I appreciate it for sure. Oh, I appreciate the time. I love, I love gear, but talking like just talking metal, why metal is, what metal does. That's my passion. Like absolutely, I, and uh, kind of, I I feel like the <laughs> the caveman unga bunga mentality, and then the more uh, the more in depth kind of lens of it, like what we were talking about. A lot of what you said really res resonated with me. Um. You know, I, I've kind of grown into uh, presenting myself a certain way, but, you know, from as long as I can remember, you know, I was the kid that actually, you know, felt something and I, you know, and I'm yeah. articulate enough to express, acknowledge and express how I feel about certain things. Um, I'm, I'm just selective who I share those with, I guess, but. That's the reality of reality in society. For sure. You know, especially being a man, whatever the fuck that means. Yeah. It's hard. I get it, man. It's another reason why art's important. Absolutely. So you can have, that's like the one place as a dude, you really get kind of a pass. Yeah. Yeah. So whether I was uh, throwing spin kicks at hardcore shows or, you know, mean mugging on stage or, you know, actually going to go see bands that I could just stand there in awe of and enjoy. Uh, it Catharsis is the best way to describe it. It's the only real true outlet. Um, and I have, you know, I've had other things, you know, whether it's like going to the gym or, you know, picking fights or drinking or whatever. At, gym, no, so. but stuff that wasn't it was a poor substitution for the expression i ever got out of whether i was drawing or writing music or performing or seeing music that was of a similar mentality to my to what i was trying to get out i guess yes yes 
Yeah. I mean, it's like all the things that you described are compulsions of the spiritual side of you that is in line with the animal, like going to the gym, getting in fights, whatever, even moshing harder to show. It's a, it's a, it's a compulsion of it, but music when done well is an accounting of it. You know, it's like it, you feel you feel seen you know in a way that uh it really how do i put it there's just a type of reveal revealing experience when you if you're an angry kid you know and i was a really fucking angry kid and i'm <laughs> a less angry man and i'm working on it uh but fuck man like there's nothing there was nothing more empowering to me than going to a show and finding out that some people are as angry as i am yeah and that's why like i had a hard time as like i loved violent shows you know not because i'm a bully you know i was <laughs> bullied growing up you know uh but because there were a group of people that saw the value the cathartic value in making one place a sanctuary for consensual violence <laughs> and uh way to put god yeah. damn it dude it fucking freed me and like violence i i just i loved it i loved going to shows and feeling scared you know what i mean like i loved that i was addicted i didn't think i realized at the time but i was addicted to that feeling i loved getting hit i loved hitting i loved I just loved it man i was just a rowdy kid yeah. and uh I know it's not for everyone. I totally get it. I don't think it's like a tough guy thing. It's just like how you're wired. You know, I was a lanky kid. I wasn't a very tough kid. I just like uh, rough, loved horseplay. And, uh, <laughs> and there is, there was something about, like you said, I could do physical hard physical exercise i could do this i could do that i could uh, hit a punching bag i could do whatever but there was something about music angry music that got all of the bells ringing in synchronicity and it all just kind of activated and it all let out you know it's like i don't know how else to describe it it's just kind of this abracadabra whatever and just got everything, just exercised it, right? And uh, I genuinely don't know where I would be if I hadn't found that. I probably would have joined the military for all the wrong reasons, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's something that, um, like I said earlier in the conversation, there's a way this music speaks to a part of the human experience that nothing else can not no other music, but like nothing else. And that's why it's never going to go away. You know, at least within the, uh, people that speaks to their soul, you know, and I think that'll always be the minority. I think for society's sake, it's probably good that it's always the minority. <laughs> like, if, if most people in the world needed death metal in their life, like yeah. we might be, uh, shit might be burning a lot faster than it is now. Um, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful whenever it gets its stride, it's always good. And the more people that, uh, are introduced to it, the more, uh, it has an opportunity to find people 
that it's real for. Yeah. You know, I mean, and you're always going to have bandwagoners. Um, but I think it's worth it. I mean, they're they're going to be gone in six months when the next fucking who cares. Right. Let them buy buy your favorite bands merch. Support them. Maybe they'll fucking go on tour sooner. You know. Yeah. Yeah, they're, um, it's, ha <laughs> this might sound a little like teen angsty, but no, it's, um, there is a little bit of truth to it when you're, you know, one of the weird kids or whatever coming up in school, there are definitely, other than just like superficial click, you know, I'm wearing black and you're wearing a, a white polo shirt or something. And I have long yeah. hair and you're, well, probably have a haircut like this. Now. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, for real though. Um, and I, I don't know why I thought about this the other day that uh, I was like, you know what? That's like, I got in, I, you know, I got in fights in school. I got in more fights after high school, but it's like, I got fights in school. There were kids, like I, I, there were people I know that I promise have never been into a fight. And it's like, how is that? How are they so drama free? And, and it's just, and it's kind of got me thinking about everything. Um, the reason that we get like this release with, with extreme music, it's like, maybe we're all just a little, you know, maybe we're all a little fucked up. Maybe. <laughs> uh, but, you know, yeah. the, and then, um, one of my favorite punk bands, uh, is uh, Pennywise and Fletcher, their guitar player. Yeah, he said in an interview one time, you know, it's like all his favorite people are damaged and fucked up. He's like, I don't want to know somebody who's normal and functional. They're boring. It's like, yeah. yeah, that's true. And I think if you dig deep enough, you can find something almost noble about being maybe not being a miserable fuck, but the thing I think possibly what resulted in you getting into a lot of fights, other people not, you being confused how it, they could even avoid it, uh, that speaks to me dead on. Same thing. I'm like, dude, do I have a punchable face? Like, what the fuck <laughs> is going on? Like, I, I get in a fight every other week. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think a simple and, and what attracts us to extreme music, why we wear black. Like, of course there are some people that will just be like, okay, that's the uniform. If I like this, I got to wear black. So they just do. But then there are people that just want to wear black because I think what you find is a lot of these people that check these boxes that we've checked, they have the gift and the curse of seeing the worst in people and it's real and there's no reprieve unless you train yourself to see the equally true goodness in people i was hardwired i know this to see the worst in man and to just have gutter vision you know to and this is hard it's a hard burden but the thing is it's not the people that suggest that you divorce yourself from this relationship with seeing through those kind of shit colored lenses the, what they don't appreciate is that there's value in seeing the worst in people because sometimes that's what the fuck is going on. Mm -hmm. And there's a real wisdom that is only accessible by having the spiritual courage and self-destruction to be able to live with those hard truths of what looking through that lens reveals. So that could be something like seeing, seeing aggression or disrespect where other people don't see it. 
and then we get into fights more often. Mm -hmm. Being more comfortable with aggression and negative discourse, so we don't, you know, we don't like. Some people say, you know, uh, turn the other cheek. Metalheads very often don't, <laughs> you know, uh, for better or for worse. Not promoting one way or the other in this moment in time, but. I think a lot of people that find their way to extreme metal are just wired to be confrontational, to be confrontational with reality, to be confrontational with people, to be confrontational with their fucking instrument. I think it's the same reason why metal is such a technically progressive genre, because there's so much fight in the soul that arrives at that kind of music that we're just always never walking away. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that can put some chips on your fucking shoulder. Uh, and, you know, you can't spend your whole life in the gutter all the time. So maybe some people can. I can. I have to... I have to take my breaks every now and again if I can figure out how to. But I think there's a real nobility into staring into the void, you know, and it's important. I think it's important and it allows other people to <clears throat> live in the divine fantasy. Yeah. And that's good, probably good for society at large, but, uh, that's how I've made sense of my uh, all those boxes being checked. Is that uh, beauty and wisdom and confrontation? We discover that early and young, and that leads us to turmoil. It leads us to heavy fucking metal music. Thank goodness for that. Uh, I don't know. I just say, sure, if you're Anyone listening, if you deal with that same shit, don't beat yourself up about it. You know, try not to be a total fucking nuisance to the people around you, but don't look away. Yeah. You know, don't look away. It gets hard. It gets harder as you get older. But uh, I want to go to the grave not looking away. And uh, vitriol is a really important vessel for me to be able to do that is to keep those eyes peeled and stare stare right at the shit I want to look at the least. <laughs> God. I, uh, I have absolutely no idea how I could possibly transition back in talking about guitar picking <laughs> shit. From <laughs> so line six, am I right? <laughs> uh, yeah. No, um, <laughs> completely uh, shifted completely to different gears going all introspective with all this but I hope everybody I hope everybody I feel like almost everybody that would be watching this has to at least understand where we're coming from and you know there's there is way more to this this isn't just I know this is a gear page but um Death metal or metal in general as a whole is a community of people that I think are generally like-minded. Uh, even maybe if you think you're just the caveman, unga bunga, drink and fight guy, uh, there's probably a reason you're that way. Um, I'm kind of that guy, but I, I know why is the best way to describe it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think there's, there's really value in the caveman unga bunga like you know there really is i mean in this it, that's that's the animal right sure. like that's what we're talking about you know it might not be the most introspective uh manifestation of of exercising the animal yeah. but it is getting back reaching back to kind of a primordial reaching back into the human primordial ooze Right. Yeah. And I think even at its lowest IQ rating, it's still kind of doing the same work. 
right? Like yeah. it, it might not be in a way that requires as much self-reflection, but it is a release of the animal. And that's why I don't like, as a guy that plays complicated music, I don't, I don't vilify like knuckle dragging death metal. Yeah. You know, it's like, I get it. I get it. It's there is, there is this kind of like, yeah, that it just, you know what I mean? And there's value in that, you know, I just, I, uh, I just hope people don't feel as though that um, if they want to make death metal, like younger people that are getting into the music or maybe not young people, but that are just discovering extreme or death metal. I just, I hope it doesn't get to a point where we find ourselves in a five year, six year rut where people think that's the only way to make death metal. That's, that's what would dismay me because I'm just grateful we're finally getting our way out of working our way out of the post necrophagist era of death metal, hmm. which I love necrophagist. I really do. Oh, I do. Uh, but fuck, did he do a number on the creative course of, of death metal, man? Like, and it lot, man, it just lost its fire, dude. Like, ugh. I mean, that was a big incubation chamber for vitriol sound was like i need shit that and this piggybacks off a conversation about the emotionality the connection with the animal the just the aggression that makes metal great that's the fire burning in the heart of metal music it seemed to go away it all just went away for the sake of perfection yeah technical perfection or oh man it just is devastating like it was just had such devastating effects on the creative course of extreme death metal that we're just finding a way back and I see this this kind of renaissance of old school death metal being a direct byproduct of the post necrophagist era mm -hmm. which was people rediscovering the aesthetic roots of death metal. Like, why is it death <clears throat> metal? Like, that's just something we all take for granted in the name. But, like, why is it death metal? Why isn't it just, like, cookie monster metal, right? Why isn't it, like, dogs doing vocals metal? Because uh, there, there was a story being told here. And that's gone, you know? And uh, I think people are becoming people that missed the pre necrophagist death metal era are now becoming acquainted with these earlier bands and being like, whoa, like, now this is an experience. Yeah. This is a, something that makes me feel something that's not just shock and wonder at how many notes these people are playing in a certain amount of time. And so I see it as ultimately a positive thing. Like I, I like to be forward. I like to keep my eyes forward. So I think there's always going to be a certain cap for me about how much I can enjoy something that's fueled by nostalgia. You know, um, I'll always kind of be that asshole. That's like, I'd rather just listen to the band that they're trying to sound like, you know, but, um, I see it as a good sign. I see it as a good sign that uh, people are kind of finding their way back to what made death metal great. Yeah. And hopefully, hopefully we can use that as the springboard to recorrect, you know, what was going on. That's why I love bands like Diabolizer, that band from that death metal band from Turkey. I posted about a couple times, like, they're a great example of a new band that are carrying the torch of what made that first wave of real death metal mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, so yeah, I just hope to see more of that. I hope this, this kind of uh, 
old school revival thing is is a way of just kind of like finding our base again being like okay we we were led astray and i love technicality my my band's technical but for a different reason you know like i like technicality to overwhelm or to create a kind of aggression or its own kind of brutality that kind of brain in a blender kind of thing <laughs> uh, but it shouldn't be there to if you're making death metal and it's supposed to sound as clean as possible i have a fucking secret for you buddy you're not making death metal you know like it's not it ain't death metal unless it's fucking ugly and it wants you to fucking die in the most constructive way possible right sure. Uh, and uh, that's I think it's cool I think it's cool that people are uh, finding uh, appreciation for the ugly and it makes so much sense when you think about what death metal has been dominated yeah. by in the last 10 years <laughs> that's uh, that's actually been a pretty regular talking point on this series with a lot of guests um, about technicality being something that's welcomed and that we you know we love it's it's like it, another analogy it's like when you do get into weightlifting you start to appreciate like the bodybuilders and strong men and stuff and power lifters out there in the world because you have uh you know you have a base to compare it from now um so you know we love seeing like some acrobatics and it's fun to to push yourself to do that stuff but once that becomes more important than the songwriting or the overall big picture, um, yeah, it's like you you miss the point. Um, yeah. Which, quick side note before I forget, Justin from Sinister Metal wanted to thank you for his uh, Steel Weather strap that's coming to. Oh, him. oh yeah. Thanks for picking it, it up, Justin. <laughs> I re I'm really excited for you to get it. But uh, yeah, no um whether it was uh, bands like um, Early Decapitated, Beneath the Massacre, Necrophagist, Nile, uh, Hell, Christian, and Immolation, all these, all these, you know, heavy hitters that we're all familiar with. They, uh, incredibly technical, very challenging music to play. And the reason that we're still talking about them is because they, they got it. They got the idea of songwriting, not just, you know, um, which I'm not they didn't saying really tech death bands put a lot of thought into composition, you know, probably, probably too much. They're, uh, yeah. th they're just not telling the right story at that point. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's a really good way of putting it. Uh, uh, I think this is why every once in a while letting yourself wax poetic about death metal is really important because it can help remind, like I asked earlier, like, why do the drums do that? Why do the drummers go bop, 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 bop on the snare? Why are these guys, why is the distortion as thick as it can be? Why are they fucking drilling the fucking, like, what, what are all of these impulses telling you about what the music's trying to communicate? So if you fall in love with metal, you gotta remain there are no rules sonically, but there are rules w of intent, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what makes metal metal, is the intent. What are you trying to do? What, are you, what experience are you trying to share with someone on the other end of those speakers? And if you lose sight of that why, if it's not to create to share some sort of, and this might be, um, some sort of experience that speaks to the adversity, the aggression, the suffering, the whatever, any of these kind of more difficult to grapple with experiences in life, if your music isn't trying to serve that, you've lost your way. And I think these bands, Nile, Immolation, Hate Eternal. Um, these were all bands that used their ambition with their instruments to further elevate the why, right? They never lost the why. They knew what they were trying to do, create a particular atmosphere, 
create a make you feel they want you to feel what they want you to feel and it's usually not something very good right it can be empowering but and i think bands if you might be more at risk if you weren't one of these kids right like you and i were or scrapping angry whatever where that will be lost on you and there might be people that through the virtue of and i think this is where you get the like non-technical elitists where they're like it's almost like brings jocks into death metal right because then you've got all these drummers and guitar players that are like oh this is hard to do so like i like this now because it's hard to do and then those guys make albums that totally miss the the why right the why metal is what it is and then those albums just don't do much they don't reach people you know because it's like it's all the it's all the smoke and mirrors but none of the heart you know um and i think that's the key you know as long as you and i think this goes beyond rules about technicality but also like how much attention you put into other aspects of your band right merch album cover stage presence you know whatever you put putting on stage or whatever as long as all that stuff is in service to the music and is there to enhance and elevate and crystallize the experience that the music is trying to provide and you always 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 put the music first everything else is great and this is where you see bands that have like oh my god this is like a fully realized vision this is amazing i'm thinking of like 2005 to 2008 behemoth mm. is a great example for me oh yeah um i think they've jumped the shark at this point but uh there was a sweet spot where it's like oh my god dude like I agree. everything we did was elevated it right it crystallized it yeah. right you man like the energy they brought on stage the uncompromising nature of what everything that they did um and then you get other bands that they might be technically like superficially doing the same things but for some reason you see this band you're like this is a fucking gimmick this sucks yeah. fuck this band and what your subconscious is telling you is that these people put the music last or fourth or whatever your bullshit meter that this is why you got to respect the listener as a musician this is why musicians fall off when they start thinking they can pull one over on their fans it's like your fans might not be able to articulate why that album is shit hmm. but if you make something dishonestly you try to cut a corner like they're just gonna sniff that out man like they won't even be able to tell you why but they're like this album sucks and i'm so grateful for that because you know it's it's why you just got to do things honest there's no way around doing it honestly right um but i think that's where you get a lot of points of tension within the metal community of like oh it's like stage you know it's like is any gimmick okay and it's like dude it's all about the why like stop stressing about the what if i have any advice for any creative person listening stop stressing about the what and just make sure you're solid on the why are you doing it for the right reasons is it because you really think it's going to elevate the message that you poured your heart and soul into with the music if, if the answer is yes then fucking do it you know because it's going to work for someone it's gonna yeah it's the one of the genuinely positive things i've learned playing death metal is that there is that truth really has a a universal power that people just you just feel it like i said you don't have to be able to articulate it but you can just feel that when something you're hearing is sincere um and what it is <clears throat> in short uh real recognizes real exactly yeah yeah
<laughs> and there is a there is a real truth to that. Is uh, and the more honestly you live, the more easy it is for you to acknowledge to perceive that honesty in other people. The dark side of that is the more honestly you try to live, the more easy it is to spot people that are full of shit. And the longer you try to be honest, the more room the bullshitters are going to take up. And then you got to protect yourself from getting like too jaded and dismissive and, you know, stuff. I feel like that's where I've been struggling lately. <laughs> I, uh... There's a reason why, uh, the hermit retreats to the cave at some point. But, uh, yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> I'm trying to avoid that for as long as I can. Yeah. It's, uh, it gets tasking. Um, and maybe it's, uh, maybe it's poor sleep, uh, stress of everything, or maybe the fact that since starting a family, I care about outside matters that much less to where I have no yeah. patience for them. Yeah. Um, I do find it like, I find myself like, all right, I need to reel this in a little bit. I'm going to like, just, go off on somebody at the wrong time at the wrong place or something. Um, There's a real risk of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I know we've, I know we've been on here a minute. I don't want to hog up your whole day or nothing. Oh no. I'm enjoying the conversation. I'm loving this. Uh, sorry to, again, sorry to anybody on here who wants to hear about pickups and strings and stuff. <laughs> Uh, honestly, I'm pickups are good. I like pickups. Yeah, strings are cool too, man. Yeah. Uh, What's next? I got a bunch. We're of <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but on, I mean, I, I get uh, selfishly, I, I enjoy how most of these just kind of turn into casual conversations. Like I was just hanging out with a buddy. So sorry, yeah. anybody who doesn't like that, you should. If you've watched any of these, you should pretty much be up to speed on how these go by now, though. I think that's better, man. I mean, as a person that views shit like this myself, I would always rather watch in an, a, a, in an, a conversation that the participants are really invested in that's off topic rather than a forced kind of on rail like all right, my favorite overdrive is this for this reason, you know, which is good. I mean, that stuff, time and place, right? It's good, good information to have. People are eager to learn. I think that's good, but uh, I don't know. This is the, this is the, obviously, because I'm talking about it, but this is the stuff that I think there's a little more value. In. Yeah. Judging by the comment section, I think a lot of people tend to agree, so. I think that's great. And I and I have uh, kept my eye on how many uh, viewers are, are in the chat room. They haven't dropped off yet, so we have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's good. I'm happy that other people care about this shit, too. Oh, shit. It's uh, the one thing that makes this raunchy music space a real community. And... Uh, as fans of extreme metal, I think a lot of us probably don't have much of a community. And I think there's a kind of not being alone and being alone that makes metal very special. Yeah. And uh, God, it's important to fucking reflect on that. Because if you want to keep this about riffs and blast beats 11 months out of the year, just check in and just be be grateful for what this music is doing to you and doing to the people around you and it's uh it's more powerful than you know yeah it really is um <laughs> i uh you i don't know how many of our viewers probably would watch it but uh as somebody who loves the instrument for what it is like you do. Uh, have you ever watched uh, guitar autopsy with uh, rusty Cooley? No, no, it's his, uh, 
podcast. It's him and another guy who runs like a music school. And, okay. And they just have shredders on. Um, they've had, they've had some pretty big names already. Uh, like uh, Mike Badio and Mark Tremonti. Yeah. Um, cool. One of the best ones I've seen so far. They had uh, Al Joseph on there. Uh, okay. If, yeah. yeah. Okay. And and a lot of it was them just kind of shooting the shit and then going into the conversation of how there's more to being a musician purposely uh, than just talking about running scales. Like, you know, you have to live a life too. You have to be an individual and a person. Other, otherwise, what do you have to talk about? You know, nobody wants to hear from you. Yes. And it's a good point. Like if you get, if, uh, it's easy to, especially in this day and age, a lot of people were in the comments are asking about program drums, which we can get to that here in a second. But yeah, and uh, I have, you know, I've got my own, like I've got Easy Drummer, my own, you know, Reaper and all that stuff here that I'll write with by myself. Um, but so in this day and age where everybody's kind of doing that same thing, it's easy to really get, you know, shut off from outside ideas and opinions. And you're just kind of in your own personal little echo chamber. And uh, you can kind of forget that it goes back to telling a story. Sometimes you kind of, you know, it lose track of what it really means. And when you have other people, if all you focus on is your scale book and you're not out there actually doing anything with your life, which maybe goes into all the recreational hoodlum fucked up things that we were talking about, yeah. you know, you've, you've got to, you've got to live a life to tell a story. Otherwise nobody cares. And sometimes part of that is also interacting with other people who hopefully are like-minded and maybe also a little bit jaded and effed up. Um, and you're all together creating something, hopefully, wholly original. And, yeah. You know? Or at the most importantly, honest. You know, I'll put that before originality any days. Yeah. I think with guitar playing, especially in metal, that's there's this technical arms race going on. I mean, there has been since the eighties, but sure. um, of who cannot play the next guy is really fucking easy to lose your why, right? And there are some people. Uh, so I think you you the best sign you have to be a musician that people really connect with is that your first goal is to express yourself, that you have something you want to say, right? Some, something you need catharsis for. For me, it was rage, you know? For me, it was a kind of a hatred so palpable, I wanted to build a cathedral to it. I wanted to prove to the world just how angry I fucking was. Like, no, you don't know. You don't know. Like, I'll show you with the fucking songs. I'll show you with the lyrics. I'll show you, like, I will. not a single punch is going to be fucking pulled. I will show you how much I hate this fucking world, you know. And uh, everything else was born from that. Mm -hmm. And I... And you kind of hear it in my guitar playing because I'm always I'm always playing a little outside my ability, uh, and I don't I never want to change that because it's this frothing, rabid, chomping at the bit, you know. Uh, and whatever way I push myself technically is in service of being able to communicate that experience. If I feel like I'm without words, it would be like someone who learned memorized every word in the dictionary but they've never tried to fucking tell a story but they don't even know why they want the words yeah you know what i mean it's like versus someone who is you know like an Ernest hemingway type who's very stoic who doesn't use very anti-shakespearean 
where to him is it is it a reason why or it, to put it back in the music realm like i'm not the biggest fan myself but i understand the appeal like nirvana right nirvana came out and here was a guy who didn't have a very robust vocabulary musically uh all he had was expression and he changed the fucking world man yeah you know and then you get something really special you get the gods when you have both you have kind of a technical mastery over your instrument and something to say right that that mastery that virtuosity can be in service to the story and that's where you have like your Jimi hendrix or that's where you have your eddie van halen right uh, these guys that man they were monsters on the instrument but that's not re you might think that's what you remember them for but you don't right because you've we've all seen people on youtube or 30 second instagram clips that could technically play those guys under the table but we don't give a shit right like we might watch a show to everybody like oh isn't that crazy and then we move on and never think about it again but it's all about at the end of the day man nobody really in a not so dark way we're all kind of selfish creatures right we want to we want something for ourselves in the shit that we interact with because it speaks to us right it speaks to our experience we feel seen so if you're making music just to be a cut above the rest technically not only are people not going to care but that's kind of going to alienate people you know no one wants to to like be the cuck to your shredding you know what i mean be like oh i'm not worthy <laughs> you know what i mean like no one really wants that experience you know like some people might you know fam <laughs> uh, some people might but you know what i mean yeah. uh <laughs> like it's like oh you know shredder senpai i could never hope to like be be there at the end of the day people want something to connect to <laughs> and that's that's an ex that's a story ultimately that tells of a universal human experience like rage or <laughs> misery or oh. <clears throat> hate or love or whatever in all these other genres right hope optimism you know just these fundamental human experiences that are universal and that's when it becomes much less about the genre and the genre just kind of becomes a vessel and it it's it's death metal because you're angry or if you weren't angry it would be indie pop or whatever if you were hopeful you know it's all about like you find what your spiritual voice is and then you find the appropriate medium to tell it and uh if you keep that why in mind you're kind of bulletproof yeah. you know just do it with love and try to connect and uh let the let the shred be in service to it yeah uh i mean i'll, I'll again as always very great profound points it was so hard to try to keep on track after you set me up with the fucking <laughs> cock and my zingers like and i'm i'm not one of the guys that uses like oh fucking cook like i don't think that i don't use that as like a general derogatory term but yeah, yeah, yeah. like really that's what if if we really want to be honest about what a lot of these dudes are aspiring to it's it's that right it's kind of this oh look at me do what you can't do and celebrate me for doing what you can't do and it's like that's not that's not enough that's not enough for me you know like i don't who the fuck are you why do i care you know yeah. most of most of people's responses to that is like oh i just want to go fucking quit guitar it's like that's not inspiring that's why i also like to think that's why some people connect with my guitar playing because I'm not nailing it all the time. And I 
really intentionally made it on the album to where I didn't perfect everything because I wanted that human element and I wanted that kind of honesty of like, man, it's okay to try and kind of whiff some stuff because that's not what this is about. This is about chasing it. This is about a dog chasing the fucking bone. Yeah. You know, and we can all relate to that. You know, we can all relate to trying and falling a little short. And that's empowering, especially to see people like doing it. Because it's with guitar playing right now, we have this, it's kind of like steroids in sports, right? Like yeah. all this ability to edit your guitars and sure. track note for note or do whatever. It's like, we have all these guys feeling pressure to be like, well, I don't want to do it, but I have to do it because to get ahead or to like for my album to sound as good as these albums, like I'm begrudgingly going to record note for note or whatever. It's like, man, you don't got to fucking, you don't got to play that game. You don't got to, you really don't have to play that game. You'd be surprised by how many people appreciate you for, for that. Yeah. Which, uh, for those that haven't had the chance to see vitriol live yet, uh, easily one of the most intense uh, live shows I've ever got to see. Um, it was something else that immediately endeared me uh, with you know with you guys. Um, when I had my thrash band, a lot of it was the honestly so fast. It was a lot of fly by the seat of your pants. Um, you know, like very like. It was intense for us playing it, honestly, a lot of the stuff. And, you know, me and the other guitar player would do a lot of, like, dual harmonies and stuff. So, and, and our drummer loved to speed up. So, we, <laughs> you know, the, uh, just that intense nature. I, I, I kind of, every time I find a band that I feel like is getting that sort of energy, and I don't mean, and for those that aren't aware, I don't mean sloppy. Or trying to play ahead of the drummer or nothing like that this is just you can see and feel it they're they're nailing it uh people that are absolutely nailing it but you can tell it they are absolutely giving it their all to get there it's like watching like world strongman competition or something or powerlifting yeah. when they're you know they're getting that five, six, seven hundred pound, even thousand pound deadlift or whatever, they're giving it their all and it's and it's immediately admirable if you recognize that. Absolutely, man. I think that's a great example. I mean I think weightlifting and death metal just are peanut butter and jelly, you know. Right. Um, <laughs> in the same way that it awakens the animal and gets us in touch with our body and our flesh and our blood and our aggression, importantly. But it's, yeah, it's a good point. You can see, you don't need, I don't even think you have to experience weightlifting to see someone, yeah. that effort and that heart to do that deadlift. And you see the veins popping at their fucking noses bleeding. Yeah. Like that guy was at the Olympics recently that the guy did that deadlift and he fucking, his nose starts bleeding and his coach is like, drop it, drop it. And he was just so fucking proud. And he was just hanging down there with the fucking, oh my God, tell me that, tell me that doesn't fucking right. light your soul on fire to see shit like that. Oh yeah. And I think uh, metal performed well with the right why, honoring the why, it all just follows. You know, I've had people ask me straight up like, oh, do you like, <laughs> do you, do you like practice your faces? And I'm like, bro, what? No, like, <laughs> you're missing the point, man. Like, you get in touch with the why, you let yourself go, you throw caution and inhibition to the wind, and the animal will show its face. And it's just going to, I've never once in my life, look anyone dead in the eye and say, I've never thought about what I was going to do on stage. Not fucking once. Not once. You know, uh, it just, you just let yourself go. And if you have that animal in you, it will f find its way through and it's going to do what it wants to do.
you know. And uh, if I'm looking out of the crowd, like, be like, man, it looks like you fucking want to kill everybody in the rooms because I do want to kill everybody in the fucking <laughs> Not actually. Yeah, yeah. But that's, you know, that's in a controlled environment. That's that voice in me that, that we all have when you're sitting in the DMV or whatever. And you just, uh, you're like, man, I just love to just clean this room out. Not, you know, not getting super dark, but, yeah. you know, we all have our own variety of destructive fantasies that our more reasonable selves don't allow to come to fruition. But for that reason, being able to get on stage and express that disdain, that general kind of misanthropic impulse that many of us just have, and it's not bad, it's just human, right? Life and death, creation and destruction, it's all there, man. It's all part of the experience. And if you don't talk about it, it's hard to own a place to release it. And I think uh, if more people had unmitigated access to extreme music, there would probably be less school shootings and shit. You know, I really believe that. <laughs> Sorry, somebody uh, somebody chimed in. So when do you guys start your own podcast? I need a regular dose of this. <laughs> metal and philosophy. The philosophy of metal music. <laughs> be great. Um, Maybe get Dylan in there, too. <laughs> what's that maybe get dylan in there too oh yeah dude and he wrote some shit on slayer oh uh, he, just f privately for himself about why slayer is maybe the most important hard rock metal band to come out of the united states and it had me not not tearing it had me crying like, it was so fucking... And Slayer's one of my favorite bands of all time. And... He... You'll have to ask him to share it with you. Yeah. Because it was just... I was like, man, I can't... What a beautiful... Like, it was so... It was such an... So honoring their contributions to having the willingness to be the mirror this goes back to what i was saying about like there is nobility and refusing to look away and taking that burden to be one of the people that explores the void and the gutter of the human soul and slayer exemplifies this yeah as someone who never stopped holding up that mirror of the deepest horrors of what it is to be a human fucking being and uh, how important that was to the culture. And I think that's why, whether people are able to articulate it or not, why Slayer will live on forever. You know, uh, at least they're more, at least their first six albums. Yeah. Beyond that, you know, people can argue. Sure. Uh, but, um, And you know, I'll uh, I think, Napalm Death into that. So. I'll throw Napalm Death into that same kind of moniker or a ring too, as far as yeah. being great at holding up the mirror to how fucked up people can be. Yeah. So. Yes. And not pulling any punches. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, being willing, a willingness to be as ugly as people can be. Yeah. And people don't like that mirror very often. People don't like seeing that part of themselves. That's why it's such a hard job. And that's why I think Slayer has earned our love and our admiration is that they just were relentless. And that's why I think it's really important for, for hard rock metal musicians to kind of have a little bit of that almost juvenile like you get it, you get kind of, you get you get some satisfaction like twisting the knife and ruffling the feathers a little bit. Cause if you didn't, it would be very hard to do this kind of work. Yeah. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's a fuel that helps embolden you to keep that 
keep holding that mirror. Yeah, absolutely. And somebody chimed in throwing death into the conversation as well. The band death. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I just remembered a video I was watching or a podcast video, whatever that I was watching last night with uh, the channel dead meat. Um, it's a horror movie. Uh, okay. Based channel and uh, it's ran by this uh, husband and wife, and they're they're just playing this just for their podcast, playing a game. It's, it was like a diff, it was a modified version of Fuck Mary Kill, where okay. Fuck Mary get killed by, and it was all like horror movie villains. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, several times throughout uh, each one of, I'm sure you've seen the movie The Strangers. Oh yeah. Okay. The characters. The three- I- as just a quick aside, best tagline, best movie poster oh. tagline of all time. No one has done a better one. Because you were home. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Fuck that. Yeah. That almost outdid the movie. Right. Because it's just like because you were fucking home. I mean, there's no just. What a fuck talking about holding a mirror up, mm-hmm. you know, just to speak to the chaos and how casual those events can be and indifferent, you know, like we all have this fantasy that if our death would be meaningful or if someone's going to kill us, it's because they hated us or whatever. It's like, no, dude, sometimes you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. And that movie's great. Anyway. Oh, Continue. I mean, that kind of plays into what the, you know, what they got onto. Several times, the individual killers that were part of like the three from the movie came up as characters that they had to pick from, and it became this ongoing joke. Like, like, well, I, I don't want to get, ki- you know, don't want to marry them because I'd be complacent. It's like they're just too real. You know what I mean? It almost, yeah. it almost like sucked the fun out of the choice because they're too real. Um, yeah, and yeah, the, it, yeah. like you, uh, you know, I was basically just going to go into that. Like, uh, they made a movie out of it and everything, and like Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer with Michael Rooker. Yeah. Yes, that shit, yes, it's when shit get <laughs> when keeping it real goes wrong. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's so right though. Yeah, you know, like I, I'm addicted to that shit, man. I mean, that's at the end of the day the same thing that qualifies a great a triumph in horror films and a triumph in extreme metal are the same barometer. How real are they keeping it? Yeah. How willing are they to go all the fucking way, you know, and not for shock value, right? Like then you have movies like a Serbian film and shit okay. where it's just like <laughs> not a great movie, but just a, just a, just a, string of the most like yeah edgiest high school kid worst fucking worst circumstances you can possibly come up with but again this is like still tying into what we've talked about in this conversation about the why yeah. like what are you trying to do and the strangers and henry uh portrait of a serial killer all of these things they have the right why Right, they're trying to give you an unflinching look yeah. at the reality of what motivates some of the, these actions, you know, and uh, I think that's there's no there's no such thing as too too real. Yeah, um, I think there's such thing as people who aren't ready mm-hmm. for that, but as as a career void gazer i love it i don't I, there isn't anything that's too yeah too real for me i i love funny games oh god for the same reason yeah no that's one of ours too it's so it's hard to watch especially as parents but we we love that movie too yeah oh my god dude. it's just genius absolutely ge- the, the same thing you know, just, I think the strangers 
probably pulled a lot from Funny Games. Yeah. Uh, I think that that movie really cracked open this whole perspective of the chaos, the chaos and the indifference of that a lot of tragedy is born from. Um, as another because you were home story, just sadistic boredom mm -hmm. can result in someone's absolute most unimaginable nightmare. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and on the back end, I think there's, um, for people that kind of were subjected to their own versions of nightmares, uh, especially developmentally, like in a weird way, these stories can be kind of, I, I think comforting is too far. It's definitely not comforting, but it lets you know it it reminds you of a familiar chaos that makes you feel less alone i think and uh that's fucking good that's yeah. a good thing yeah and you know even even aside from that uh <laughs> And in a nutshell, uh, this will sound like um, selling it short almost, but really, it 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 can be a little comforting, and uh, it can always be worse, worse kind of way. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Uh, yeah, misery loves company, especially when <laughs> the other person's misery is worse than yours. Sorry, I. Somebody, somebody left a comment. Lets you know that it's not, quote unquote, fuck you in particular. <laughs> that? Somebody commented it. Uh, watching something like that and like experiencing something like that, it lets you know that it's not, quote unquote, oh, fuck yes. you in particular. Yes. Exactly. That's a great way of putting it. <laughs> it's not personal. Man. It ain't personal. Stop taking it so personally. Life is just hard. You know? I, and uh, <laughs> there's. Man, there's a gift in that realization. Yeah. That's great. Great contribution. It, uh, funny thing is, I'm pretty yeah. sure I've I've shouted that, or not shouted, but I'm pretty sure I've said that literally like out loud while making a sharp turn onto a sidewalk on GTA or something at some point, and like just crashing into somebody on the side. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. All right. Anyway, one of my favorite lines from this. Uh, like a melodic hardcore band of all bands this band called modern life is war oh yeah on their first on their first full-length album they have a line that really fucking stuck with me and i still think about it to this day i was a teenager when i heard it but it just says the last line is the world isn't against you my dear it just doesn't care okay yeah. and that was that like as an angsty kid, yeah. teenager, when I heard that, that fucking hit me like a ton of fucking bricks. And I mean it when I say that that line shape was a perspective shaping and it was liberating because there are two ways that you can respond to the indifference of the universe. And that's kind of a ecstatic sense of freedom and liberty. Or that's kind of like this fearful cowering in the absence of God. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, like, oh, my God, there isn't a plan for me or, like, whatever. It's like, yeah, well, who said if there was a plan for you, it would be a fucking good one? You know, like, no one promised you a good one. And it's kind of a uh, – I, I chose to see it as I, – I chose to see the liberty uh, in that, which was if life has no purpose, uh, I – have the power to make my own. Isn't that cool? Isn't that fucking cool? You know? And it's a lot of responsibility. And a lot of people don't like that. But, uh, man, is the juice worth the squeeze. Yeah. I love that. I love that. But, yeah, it's not a... And somehow it does make the shitty stuff sting less when you realize it wasn't personal. You were just home on the wrong day. Right. You know? <laughs> well, 
Uh, Charming, I know. <laughs> you're getting over a sickness from tour. Oh, you're good. Well, uh, this is hardly the smooth transition, but I noticed the time, so I'm going to try to. Yeah, try to get let's some direct some questions or whatever. Yeah. Um, let's see, what do you? What's something that you look for in a guitar? Uh, pickup wise, aesthetically, so on, so forth. Ooh, man, there's a lot. Um, basics has to have a floating trim. Okay. Right. Always. Like, I like. I like a good fixed bridge guitar to jam on, but if I'm gonna play it, like, and make music on it, has to have a floating trim. Hmm. Um, has to have a fairly shreddy neck profile. I can't do baseball bat necks. I can't do Gibson necks. I can't do, it has to be, have kind of a flat C ish, uh, pickups, active electronics. I love my EMGs, uh, actives in general. Um, and as far as shape goes, no surprise here. It's got to be angry. It's got to be pointy. It has to be a proper tool for the trade. If your music wants to kill people, it's just your guitar should want to fucking kill people too. <laughs> uh, pretty basic logic for me there. Uh, you know, dress for the job that you want, as <laughs> the parents tell you. Exactly. Uh, and the guitar should inform the approach. Uh, but as far as pointy guitars go, they have to be balanced. You know, there are a lot of abominations out there and you can't just <laughs> overlook, you can't overlook <laughs> you can't overlook a well balanced and designed body for the sake of extremity. Um, it has to be and that's why the warrior for me so far is the ultimate extreme metal shape. Um, it's fucking beautiful. Like if, if you really sat there and stared at it long enough and broke it down and looked at the physics of it and the rhyme and the reason and like, <clears throat> my God is such a triumph in design. It's sleek, but barbaric. It's vicious, but elegant. It's, it's, it's the ultimate shape um, because it had its cake and it ate it too. You know, it was like, that was for me, like going way back uh, after getting back into pointies in my teens, that was kind of my Holy grail was like, I want to find the shape that addresses form and function and doesn't compromise on either. And so far the warrior has been the best at that for me. Um, I'm trying to outdo that in my own way with the custom word I'm working on with Dylan um, to really kind of take that logic to the next step of being super high performing. Every point has a reason, has a rhyme and a reason to it, why it's there, the role that it serves functionally and cosmetically. Um, I'm very excited for that. I have no idea when that's going to be done, but uh, yeah, there will be news when I have news. But uh, well, that's that's about it for what I like look for in a guitar. Well, uh, first off, shout out to uh, our homie Joe Anastasio from Lone Wolf Audio. He's in the chat. Yes, sir. But uh, is there any? I didn't see him there. Is there yeah. anything that you can uh, tell us about the uh, Zerker? Oh, I mean, there isn't really much I can say outside of what's already been shown. Mm -hmm. um, what can I say? What can I say? Um, I took the same approach to that guitar. I designed it, uh, which I'm very grateful for and proud of that Dylan was willing to give me that freedom. 
it was very, very, <laughs> it took many rough drafts for me to finally sell him on it. When I showed him the first one, he's like, nah, dog. <laughs> nah, it's going to be a no for me. I was like, no, man, you just don't like, and I actually had to become a better illustrator just to communicate my idea. Um, and, uh, but I, I approached the design the same way that I approached Vitriol's music, honestly, which was, I'm going to take my favorite aspects of every guitar that I've played, and I'm going to try to incorporate them into one design. Uh, and that's what I did with this one. So it has like all my favorite lines, you could say, like as far as the physics goes, of the BC Riches I fell in love with. Yeah. It has uh, the... If you look at it closely, here's, I guess, some inside scoop. It's actually, it looks very different from a warrior, of course, now. But if you were to look at it, it's kind of a mirrored image of a warrior as far as the lines go. Because I had this moment thinking, playing with my warrior, what I like about, on the subject of assimilating the, my favorite aspects of the guitars I played, what I really like about a King V not a Rhodes V, but a even V. That when you're standing with it, you can hook that bottom horn on the inside of your thigh mm -hmm. and kind of have it rip it kind of upright like that. Yeah. I really like that, being able to power stance and bring my neck up and do that kind of shit. Uh, so I, I actually always liked the, the reverse Rhodes for that reason. I just thought it was a great yeah. design. Yeah. And also that big horn, like your forearms cover most of it anyway. You know, you're, it's it's sticking outside of your body, so it's just ready to be fucking smashed on something. So I had this idea. I'm like, oh, I could do like a reverse warrior design, which if you were to take a warrior and flip it, now that long horn is on the underside where you could hook it into your thigh. That shorter horn on the bottom is where your forearm would go. Mm -hmm. So it's a little less in the way. You could sculpt it, make it more of a forearm ramp. You know, like a what's great about a, a super strat. Um, and then the long horn is at the top, kind of like a strat. So you're not dealing with neck dive or having to put the button on the inside of the horn. And then you have the shorter horn for your upper fret access. So you don't have this big yeah. fucking hook getting in the way of your forearm as you're trying to sweep on the 24th fret or 27th fret in, in the case of the zerker um so that was my kind of eureka moment so my whole the whole design actually started with me kind of tracing over a reversed scan of a warrior body and i tried to follow the physics yeah instantly well while creating my own kind of shapes. I'll definitely have to take another look at it again. I, I mean, I've seen the pictures a hundred times, but now that you've actually pointed that out, I, I want to go take a look at it to really kind of dissect it. And uh, I'm, I mean, it, it sounds like everything that makes sense to me, like that uh, while I've played V's in the past and stuff, you know, especially like a Rhodes V or something, um, how much I miss having the lower horn there to, to prop up or even, yep. even sitting with it. Like I, I always play classical position, you know, yeah. with every, Same. every guitar. Um, I, I don't know how people play standard. Like it hurts. <laughs> like, I have no idea. Yeah. I'm been a, from day one played classically. That's actually why I've always liked the warlock. I think it's like the ultimate seating guitar. Heck. Cause the bottom horn fork just sits right in your right thigh. Mm -hmm. And then the cut sits right on your left thigh. Yeah. And it's just is perfect. I feel the same way. So I want to do that. I want to play something that designed something that seated well, designed yeah. something that strapped up well and uh, played allowed a non-metal, well, they're metal, but a non-pointy guitar company actually 
really, really like the work that they do is Music Man. Mm -hmm. I like Music Man guitars a lot. I like the design uh, team. Uh, while I wouldn't play those guitars myself, I really admire the innovation that yeah. they uh, bring to their designs. And, uh, you know, the Petrucci Majesty series are incredible guitars. And I took a lot of, um, I wanted to make sure, that was kind of my litmus test for the design. I was like, I wanted to be as accessible in terms of high performance playing as like a Petrucci Majesty. So yeah. I wanted to make sure all of the, the layout of like the knob and the toggle switch and the fucking horn cutaway and all that stuff was on par. Yeah. Which I actually have played a, a majesty, like like one of the high end, like what is it, three to four grand majesty. Yeah. Um, those things, it, it was not for me. Uh, for one thing, I felt like I was going to break it in my hands. Um, yeah. I felt like I was playing a ukulele in a way. <laughs> but, uh, dude, the thing practically played itself. It sounded great. Yeah. And uh, per performance-wise, I mean, it, it, it couldn't it – not, not only does it get out of your way, um, it, like I said, uh, the notes just almost come off themselves. Like, Yeah. So, it's an incredible instrument. Oh, yeah, for sure. I feel like I, just like with anything, there's going to be – some things might not suit someone's taste, but yeah. as far as just like an extremely well-designed guitar to do what it's trying to do, uh, man, I mean, I think it's it's leading the pack yeah. among like the technology of shred guitars. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just so well-designed. And of course it would be with John Oops. fucking Petrucci behind it, but... Uh, very cool. Well, <clears throat> we uh, we have officially hit the three hour mark, so I will. Holy shit! Really? Yeah. Oh wow. So uh, okay, I will take that as our cue to do my yes. uh, my my wrap up question, which is asking for your top four death metal bands and or albums. Your four. Yeah, yeah. Everyone gives me that. <laughs> It's hard for everybody. Oh, no. Uh, oh. That's why, uh, whatever's easier, for, if you can't do four bands, maybe like the four quintessential albums, whether it's like what helped shape, what helped shape who you are as a death metal fan and connoisseur today. Like, maybe what's uh, what you find the most influential for vitriol or how, whatever uh, parameters help you narrow it down. <laughs> Things are so fucking hard, man. Um, That's but I'm gonna I'm gonna bite the bullet and try because I always feel like I'm leaving out something important. Um, first ones that come to mind that especially directly influenced Vitriol Sound, like albums I actually studied to be like, what is it about this album that does what it does to me so well? Uh, it's uh, I Monarch by Hate Eternal, um, Annihilation of the Wicked from Nile. Um, uh, um, Failures for Gods from Immolation. That's a good one. Um, what would the best fourth one be? Maybe Exterminate by Angel Corpse. Um, okay. Gene's riffing in general uh, between Angel Corpse and Perdition Temple. Uh, like my love for Perdition Temple is is no secret. I make it no secret. Um, I think he's one of the most under celebrated uh, death metal guitar players. Period. Um, I think he's written some of the best riffs, and how he, how he writes his riffs. Going back to the why. I mean, this is a guy that fucking gets what death metal is supposed to do and never fails at delivering it. I'd say Gene's guitar playing is a probably solely why almost every vitriol riff is tremolo picked. Hmm. 
because that's something that immediately inspired me about Gene's playing was that like this guy's like blast beating on a guitar effectively I mean this guy just never fucking stops it's just just fucking spiraling mazy angular fucking just madness like he's such a such a fucking riffsman him Bob Vigna Eric Rutan, Carl Sanders, those guys were big guitar riff composer heroes for me. Um, but man, I mean, that list is so long. I mean, there are more contemporary bands that really influenced me too, but I would say those are like Morbid Angel is so easy. It, it feels like such low hanging fruit as to not need to mention, but Tucker era Morbid Angel, like Formula's Fatal to the Flesh is my favorite Morbid Angel record. And that record, um, uh, that record was just so fucking. Yep. What we got here? Hang on. Hey, there you are. Oh, that's all right. Someone asked what the fourth album was. I think that was Exterminate by Angel Corpse. Yeah. I think that's what I said. Okay. Yeah. I think that was the fourth one. Yeah. We said uh, Iron uh, Ark, Annihilation of the Wicked, uh, Failure of Failures for Gods. Yeah. Which isn't, in retrospect, like my favorite emulation record, but that was the album that really hooked me. Yeah. I think Close to a World Below is probably my favorite at this point. But, yeah, I think those bands in general, like, their discography, their approach, mm -hmm. that overall inspired me a lot. Sure. And I, I can really hear it, too, like all those. If, and I, I, as far as uh, bands that if I were really sitting and picking apart vitriol, I, I could hear influence, not direct rip-offs obviously but i can definitely hear the influence of those and i'd even throw in christian too yeah it's funny i've I, that was a that was a name that was kicking around in my head um that band i think is very important i think um they were a band that really understood the, the, the technical playing's ability to create a claustrophobic sound and uh, like black force domain um their debut lp is what maybe what one of the best examples of how chasing your instrument can really help create a chaotic warlike uh experience I, I i mean i think that album was kind of proto war metal to be honest like if you listen to that album like obviously yeah. like blasphemy and conqueror and stuff those bands get the you know really sealing the deal but it was right around the same time that black force domain came out and it had this very bestial uh darkness to it mm -hmm. that um, was unhinged it was fucking messy it was not clean. It was like, it sounded like the two brothers, the drummer and the guitar player were like scrapping it out, you know, like just trying to outrun the other guy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that, that approach to making death metal was really inspiring to me. I couldn't agree more. One of my personal favorites too, but tell you, but, uh, dude, this is this has been a blast. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, Thank you, man. Three hours flew by. I really thought it was like maybe it was two. <laughs> yeah. But. Yeah, no, I looked up and went, oh, shit. Uh, it's dinner time. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, this is this is one. Uh, this is one interview I can say that when I first started doing these. Uh, maybe I guess a little over a year ago. Uh, that this, this particular one with you was one of the ones that I had in mind. 
uh, oh, awesome. happen. So thank you so much for, for doing this, man. Absolutely, man. Thank you for having me. And if there are, uh, you know, if anyone who's still watching had questions unanswered, especially like gear related ones, um, you know, maybe uh, if you're open to it, you could, we can meet up again and have a more like on rails yeah. where I just like answer questions because I know we just ended up bullshitting most of the time, which was great. But I'm sure people would appreciate some of those answers from me. And uh, I'd like to give them. Yeah, we'll look. We'll do a legit Q and A session sometime, for sure. That'd be awesome. Um, well, is uh, is there anything that you wanted to try to plug real quick, like next tour or anything? Or, I don't know. Nope. No. Not really. Just <laughs> uh, I'm working on the finishing the tab book. So rest assured. And uh, the rest of the time, I'm finishing the next album. So. Hell yeah! Can't wait to hear it. And I uh, can't wait to see more of the uh, Zerker. <laughs> Me fucking too. Next two of us. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks. All right, man. Thank you so much. Until next time. Everybody, have a good weekend. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> yeah, thank you. See you guys. See you.